Um, the whole globe can follow our conference today here in Brussels in the European Parliament. But I would like to warmly welcome all of you, all the participants, uh, the distinguished speakers, also the representatives of the institutions, including the European Commission. I've seen our uh, representatives of DG Klima and DG NIR as well, so it's, it's highly attended by the Commission, also representatives of the um, energy community. Uh, so I think that we are having a very interesting discussion uh, today. First of all, I would like to say thank you for those who initiated this very timely and important discussion today, uh, namely to E3G, uh, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, and the Balkan Green Foundation, who uh, organized and initiated uh, the conference. And also, I would like to say thank you for members of my own staff who uh, did their best and worked a lot on, on um, putting together this uh, event uh, today. Why we are here, uh, what is the policy background of uh, uh, our discussion today? Of course, you, I think that uh, most of you already uh, know that, that um, in the last couple of years in the European uh, Parliament, in the European Union, there was a very important uh, policy-making procedure, uh, the adoption of the Clean Energy Package, which is close to be completed. Still, we have some ongoing files uh, in the trilogue level, and uh, some decisions should be finalized. But uh, we had a long and important procedure to set up uh, the rules, goals, targets, and frames of um, uh, climate and energy policy in the EU for the next uh, 12 years till uh, 2030, including renewable energy uh, directive, energy efficiency uh, directive, the governance of the energy union, electricity market design, um, uh, the buildings uh, directive, and so on and so forth. And I think that where we are now in the European institutions in the EU is really perhaps far from my dreams, also far from what we really need according to the recent IPCC reports, but still it's uh, able to mobilize forces and resources in the EU uh, to speed up the energy transition uh, in the European Union. Of course, still, there is a lot of things to do, uh, partly on the European level, partly in the member state level. In the member states, uh, we need um, uh, the preparation of the integrated national energy and climate plans, and so on and so forth. But still, we have a very strong and um, um, fairly ambitious climate and energy policy for the next uh, one and a half uh, decade. Uh, also, there are important uh, parts of the new regulation which go beyond the traditional energy policy making and has important effects on economic um, uh, structures, um, creating jobs and also uh, social um, um, or, or, or social questions are, uh, are touched by, by the regulation. Uh, I would like to turn your attention and raise and underline this twice, how important uh, what um, the new clean energy package and especially the energy efficiency di directive does about energy poverty and how the energy transition should happen in a just way. So it's not enough to technically uh, make the energy transition, and it's not enough to cut our CO2 or greenhouse gas uh, emissions, but it's also at least as important to do it in a way uh, that takes everyone on board and um, do not make the energy transition privileges of um, uh, the rich countries or the rich groups of the uh, society, but which makes it possible to be part of the energy transition for all of the European citizens. And of course, uh, the EU regulation and the clean energy package is important not only for Europe. As we are facing with the Katowice uh, COP24, um, and the EU likes to regard itself as a front runner of uh, climate uh, policy making. It's important what kind of example uh, the EU gives for the Katowice uh, meeting. 
Um, and especially it is important to have a look on the closest neighborhood of uh, the EU, namely the energy community countries in the Western Balkans, in, in Ukraine, and, and other uh, countries of the energy uh, community. As for them, uh, what is happening in the EU is not only an example, but might have direct um, effect uh, on the rules, uh, regulation they have or they should uh, adopt. Uh, so I think it, it has a special importance to have a closer look on what is uh, happening uh, in the energy uh, community. Uh, but also we have to keep in mind that uh, this cannot happen simply like a translation of the EU regulation to uh, those countries. Uh, as um, in the energy community um, states, uh, there are very special circumstances on the energy market sometimes. So we have to keep in mind that how the EU can best contribute uh, to incentivize um, uh, those uh, countries uh, to follow the EU in the energy transition. And uh, it's especially very important to point out uh, how risky um, or how high is the risk that some bad decisions made today can be resulted in long-term technological, economic, or geopolitical lock-ins for those countries. That's quite similar for the EU some of the EU member states as well. So we, we have very similar situation in, for example, in Hungary with um, our well-known nuclear uh, dreams uh, to build a new Russian nuclear power plant or in Poland with coal. Um, but also we have very similar uh, questions um, um, in, in the Western Balkans on, on in, in Ukraine. Uh, regarding this, uh, E3G and the Henry Bell Foundation have just published a very important paper, and I believe that uh, some of the speakers will uh, mention this, um, uh, this study, which is um, the, with the title High Carbon Lock-in versus Low Carbon Opportunity in the Western Balkans with policy recommendations well worth uh, to take into consideration, um, as uh, I think it's a very important analysis that what are really the risks and what are the options, the possibilities uh, for the Western Balkans uh, countries and for Ukraine to move towards uh, a more sustainable, more renewable and energy efficiency based energy uh, system. And of course we have to map up that how the EU can the most efficiently and effectively contribute to this transition. This means proper regulation, this means money, and this means technical um, um, assistance and um, participation or, or cooperation with those countries to help them to uh, make the change as quick and as smooth as uh, possible. So I think that there are a lot of important questions to uh, discuss today, and we have a set of uh, high-level and distinguished speakers to, uh, to give us a detailed insight uh, to those uh, questions. But uh, before giving the floor to my colleagues, uh, I would like to also to, uh, to say that um, I'm not alone hosting this event today the, in the European Parliament, but Rebecca Harms, my fellow uh, MEP uh, from Germany, I think most of you know her very well. Um, she is also co-host of the event. Unfortunately, she is not able to be here with us today, but uh, she sent a short video message to the participants of, of the conference. So first, I would like to ask the colleagues to start the video message from Rebecca Harms. participants uh, today in the event of Heinrich Böll Foundation and uh, all co-organized. 
So dear participants uh, today in the event of Heinrich Böll Foundation and uh, co-organized uh, by me and my colleague uh, Javor Benedik, I have first of all to excuse myself. I'm, when you are meeting, already on my way to Kiev, five years uh, after Euromaidan, and many uh, commemoration events uh, keep me busy right now in Kiev and Ukraine. But I would like to say that the issues you are discussing today on the Western Balkans, but also on Ukraine and the Eastern Partnership, these energy transition projects really matter. In all the countries we are talking about, there is a big need for future projects and innovation. And I can only recommend to everybody in those countries, don't miss the opportunities to jump really into the energy future. Don't discuss about prolongation of nuclear or prolongation of coal or clean coal. Uh, do it fundamentally, the change, the necessary change. Climate friendly is uh, to focus an energy system uh, on energy efficiency and renewables. Thank you. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, Robert Sperfeld. <coughs> Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, on behalf of the uh, initiators and co-organizers of, uh, of this event, uh, which is the Balkan Green Foundation, E3G, and, and the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Uh, I'm representing uh, the team for East and Southeast Europe of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. We have offices <coughs> uh, in Belgrade, in Sarajevo, and in uh, Kiev, and in uh, Bilisi. Which one? This one? That one? Okay. Good. So, then, more complicated than expected. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and uh, so the core of our work on this topic is uh, to cooperate with uh, uh, civil society uh, organizations, environmental uh, um, movements in, in those uh, countries, and uh, <clears throat> we try to uh, establish better links between uh, uh, the, the public discourses in these countries and on, on the European uh, level. And uh, a, a lot, uh, yeah, but uh, first, this, this got lost now. I, I also want to, to thank uh, Rebecca Harms and Benedek Javor and his team for hosting this event. This is uh, uh, very important that we have this opportunity to uh, bring this discussion to, to Brussels here now with uh, lots of uh, voices from the region. Um, a, a lot was uh, said already, that's why I will be really brief, uh, as, as Rebecca has uh, stated already, uh, uh, the, the, we shouldn't uh, miss the opportunity now uh, in the region when uh, in the upcoming years many uh, uh, energy infrastructure will be replaced. We shouldn't miss this opportunity uh, now to, uh, to design the replacement uh, investments in a sustainable way. Uh, uh, when we uh, take the climate targets uh, serious, then this is uh, really it should be a priority. Um, our uh, con we, we are convinced that uh, we need to raise more attention uh, in uh, Brussels on the EU level, but also in the member states uh, for the uh, importance and for the important role of the EU in the energy community region, in, in Western Balkan and Eastern Partnership region. Uh, the EU is perceived and, uh, as a uh, uh, very Im important uh, player and driver for, for any reform processes and uh, this, uh, in this situation a, a very proactive stance from side of uh, the EU is required. Uh, and 
we are convinced that uh, it is also in, in, in EU's own interest to get engaged uh, in the um, uh, modernization and energy transition um, uh, facilitation in, in the region um, because uh, it is not only uh, it, it not only refers and concerns the, the energy sector, but it, we should uh, not forget the bigger picture. Uh, the just energy transition can be a huge opportunity to contribute uh, not only to climate protection and to reaching the climate goals, but also to uh, prosperity, uh, peace and stability in the region, uh, which uh, is uh, often a bit uh, overlooked um, as, as, is, as was our uh, impression. So um, I wish everyone a, a fruitful discussion and I will hand over to Ada uh, who will uh, facilitate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I hope that this mic works for me now. Um, thank you also, I would like to Thank you for coming here and, uh, and uh, obviously to our hosts, Benedek and uh, Rebecca, uh, to make it uh, possible to have this meeting here. Um, and also to our funders who made possible not just this meeting, but the work behind the meeting and what led us to, to come to the European Parliament, um, the possibility that we uh, uh, assessed actually the, the the region, what we are talking about, and uh, and what made us uh, compiling the report. What you have seen already, probably uh, next to the to the entrance, um, the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, should be mentioned here. Uh, also, as you might know, E3G is, uh, was established to accelerate the change, what needs to happen in order to, to step on and, and keep moving on this, pay, of this path which leads us to uh, a sustainable uh, transition or to a, a green economy. And uh, this is what we are doing, and, and hopefully you will see that, that in Western Balkan there are tremendous opportunities for that, and also in Ukraine. Um, and we are going to discuss that here. Hopefully we'll reveal some of the most important issues uh, with our distinguished uh, speakers. And at this point, I would like to uh, ask uh, the next panel to come to front to, is it okay? To come to the front and uh, I'd like to introduce Vizar Azami in the, in the meantime, who is uh, the director of the Balkan Green Foundation and uh, who will facilitate the next half an hour where we are going to see three different examples and stories from Western Balkan, uh, mostly on coal. So these are a few. Yeah. Mirjana uh, Jovanovic, who is uh, from Serbia, Belgrade Open School. Um, also, Denis Zisko from the Center for Ecology and Energy from Bosnia, Herzegovina, sorry. And Burim Ayupi from INDAP, the International Development Policy, Kosovo. Please take a seat.
you will see over there. But I don't, I don't have Do we have a device? I have to sit there. Yes, I someone will. I will sort it out for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ara, for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like also to thank the host of uh, this uh, event, Benedict and Rebecca, Rebecca, for having us here today to discuss about the high-carbon lock-in versus low-carbon opportunities in the Western Balkans. My name is Visara Zemi, as Ada introduced, and the director of Balkan Green Foundation. Today we uh, will have a, a short panel on um, the state of affairs in three Western Balkan countries which we choose to be most problematic and controversial in terms of investments in the energy sector, which basically uh, everyone is aiming for more coal investments and uh, ignoring the developments and opportunities that come uh, in, in the other side where renewables seem to be more feasible now. As you're all aware, the Western Balkans are home to numerous coal-fired power plants, uh, and there are also plans to build new ones, which uh, are quite controversial. Uh, the last uh, case is in Kosovo with Kosovo C, and uh, we have also seen that the uh, international financial investments are openly saying that renewables have come cheaper than coal in the last uh, few months. So. As we know, current developments in the energy sector are leading to high carbon lock-in in the region um, to basically lock down the countries in the Western Balkans for another 40 years with fossil fuels. The main narrative that has been used uh, to justify these investments are the security of supply, but they are failing to understand that security of supply can also be achieved by diversification of the energy sources. And this is something we would like to emphasize as well. And again, request that the European Union and Commission does something in that regard. So we also believe that EU should show some stronger and political and security interest in the region and work with Western Balkan countries towards a decarbonization path, which can also lead towards their enlargement and solving the problem when these countries will join the EU one day. We have also witnessed that many utilities in the EU have been shutting down their fossil fuel plants. Uh, and this, the reason for that is basically price decrease of renewables and the CO2 issues that are under the emission trading scheme. I would not take uh, the time of the panelists who would basically explain and describe the state of affairs in their own countries. But I would like to start with Miriana, which is uh, next to me here, with uh, the progress or the uh, issues in Serbia that are dealing with the uh, high carbon lock-in and versus opportunities in the, with renewables. So Miriana, please. Thank you, Isar. Well, my story will practically support what you just said. Do we have the, the presentation? Yes. So when Visar uh, asked me if I could be able to say a few things about high carbon versus low carbon, this is the one picture came into my mind. Can you go? And this is the one. So when you talk about high carbon development and low carbon development, now this is the, the state of the, of, the, of the play. High carbon is uh, highly fi favorized in, in Serbia. And uh, the, how things are looking right now, low carbon has little chance. Can we go on? And this is why. This is these are some just some numbers, where you can see that Serbia at the moment is uh, highly addicted to high carbon options. We have very high energy and carbon intensity that are three to five times, uh, three to four times higher than, than the ones of average EU country. And we have high energy losses within the production and distribution systems. And there are some reasons why, why this high carbon addiction comes from, and this is one of them. We have very, very long history of coal mining, 
and there are regions where working in coal industry is a part of your identity and your culture, and this is where high carbon gets one point. And also we have this mindset that uh, our energy infrastructure needs to be centralized, needs to be controlled uh, centrally from the uh, state, that it brings, uh, that it needs to have large investments in large objects and that it supplies, uh, provides energy security and social prosperity and uh, that it brings thousands and thousands of jobs. This is where the high carbon gets one, another point. And uh, what about political uh, messaging and framework uh, and strategic framework where the, the high carbon versus low carbon battle is going on? Well, first of all, we see uh, coal as our cheap domestically available fuel versus uh, renewables that are uh, commonly portrayed as uh, expensive and that need, need to be imported. And uh, the, the main underlying message is that we are not rich enough to go for this low carbon option. Can we go next? And this is one very, very uh, strong political message where we had a, a government meeting uh, it was one year of the government, uh, pr today's President Vucic was uh, Prime Minister then, and it was held in the middle of coal mines. So if nothing, this is one strong, strong political message, we support carbon, high carbon. And this is another point. It could be more than one, but let's, let's be simple. And this reflects on strategic framework of Serbia. So this is a quotation from, from energy strategy of Serbia, where we see that even though we have declared by signing uh, stabilization and association accession um, agreement with the European Union, and we said that we intend to implement EU policies that are going towards decarbonization until 2050, we still are planning and relying on coal long after 2050. Next. And this is also reflecting on, on energy prices. Here we have a Eurostat uh, electricity pri uh, price uh, diagram where we see that the, in Serbia uh, electricity, electricity price is very cheap, it's very low, because it does not include externalities. And if externalities were included, Energy Community has published in 2013 a study and assessed that externalities would add 10 euro cents more to the price. So who is paying this difference between 7 and 17? Of course, uh, citizens of Serbia are paying for it, but they are not really aware of it. And uh, in this, this uh, setting, uh, this low price of, of uh, electricity does not really uh, give chance to uh, renewables to penetrate the electricity market since it is uh, highly supported by the system. And finally, what can the what can European Union do about this? First of all, I have to mention energy community that is very important and give us guidelines to implement uh, and translate uh, European energy and climate policies within the energy community countries. And this is something that uh, is mandatory uh, for energy community countries in Serbia as well, because we are members and signatories of the energy community contract. Uh, however, uh, mechanisms to which enforcement is controlled are not uh, strong enough sometimes, so this is where we could use some help from European Union. Uh, uh, European accession process is uh, uh, important and the strongest driver of, uh, of decarbonization and development of low carbon options in Serbia. And uh, the decarbonization and energy transition needs to be uh, uh, included in this path. So what we would uh, uh, really use from, uh, could use from European Union is a strong message from European Union to our uh, uh, political decision makers is that decarbonization and energy transition are reality. They're not happening 10 years from now, they're happening now. And they should be one of the key requirements of EU accession process, just like the rule of law is. Uh, next, that uh, energy uh, transition and decarbonization uh, actually are offering uh, op opportunities for economic development and that uh, they're not uh, with proper conditions leading us toward, uh, towards poverty and uh, dependence on import uh, energy. Uh, the message should also come to our political leaders that environmental standards and climate change policy must, must be integrated within, ener within energy policy. And the most important role would uh, message would be that uh, non-compliance with 
energy, ener environmental energy and climate policies along the EU accession path are not an option for, for a candidate country. So if, uh, if these messages were clear, then our accession path would be much uh, smoother and once when we become a, a, a member state, we would then be uh, easily adapted to EU. No, that's it, I, I didn't measure, did I no, take more time? <laughs> okay. it's, uh, it's Thank you very much, Mirjana. So certainly there's some demands that are required uh, or requ is, are requiring the European Union to take a more firm stance on exactly. on, on, on certain things, which um, the position will, of them will have to be a bit clear on investments and the lock-in of uh, high, car high carbon investments in, in the region. So this is the case for Serbia, obviously, but I'm pretty sure it's the case for the next two countries, which uh, we will be hearing now. So uh, I would go next with uh, Burime Yupi from NDAP in Kosovo uh, to say a bit on the stances in Kosovo. We have been dealing, so I mentioned the Kosovo Sea investment which somehow is, uh, is not moving forward because uh, apparently the price of renewables are declining and apparently that seems to be a more feasible option. So what do you think on that? Thank you, Visar. The situation is more or less like in Serbia. I think all the region, also Bosnia and Herzegovina, the countries who are relying on that all production, production of the energy rely on coal, we will have the same situation. Now we are maybe as a Kosovo better situation as the World Bank now, EBRD, just reject finance of the new power plant and officially said that there are the cheapest um, option for energy bill as uh, renewables. This is the, how we call it maybe the red light for a politician in Kosovo, also in the region, in that there is a other option that build a new power plant. Maybe only the few uh, facts about Kosovo. Kosovo is a small country with 10,000 square meters. We produce 97% from the coal power plant and the Newest generators in, is in the function is built in, in 1984. That means 34 years ago. And also one of the problem about low co uh, highest carbon are the cars and trucks in the road of Kosovo. There are more than 300,000 cars and trucks in Kosovo road. From them, 60% of them are older than 15 years ago. Most of them are diesel fuel. And also quality of diesel is very no, nobody knows how is the quality. And these are some of the problems we are facing in Kosovo, except the power plant. But one thing what uh, was happening, it was in 2016, the United States Embassy put the matter to, matter in, to publish how many PPM are uh, three or four times during the day. And that um, data published real time on air pollution in Kosovo. And everybody who has the uh, smartphones, in Kosovo most of them they have smartphones, they can uh, download the app, Air Visual, and you can see in the real time how is the uh, PPM and the air pollution in Pristina. The topic of air pollution has blown in the public debate and everybody without distinction was shocked by the data. Many people who haven't suffered the consequences of air pollution before, for the first time they start the question, why and how they come. Those in the very short, on, short time, air pollution turned in the central team and the positive pressure force for that second answer. Before this, we know that the uh, air, uh, air in Pristina is uh, not very good, but somebody say they are from the uh, power plants, somebody say old cars, but now when we see the results, also, there are some pressure for citizens. In 2017, there have been some protests, not organized by civil society organization or some groups or political group, but just citizens go in front of the square in Pristina, wear some mask and say, we want the clear air. But how the situation was, now everybody, even the online portals, they report about air pollution, how is it in Kosovo. And this is something that also we, as a civil society activist, we have one tool to fight for the better uh, for low, uh, low carbon in Kosovo. 
Now we are just accepting from Kosovo government. They promised us that during the October they will show us data about who are the main factor of pollution in Kosovo. Till now they are, didn't publish nothing, but we will know for sure that something will happen. Now the Ministry of Environment uh, declared to ban the coal consumption for family economics. That is good. Um, that is one step about doing so, uh, something about air pollution from the government. Also now the government are preparing the new strategy in climate change, something they just had before. It, we are meeting the government officials in 2015. Nobody, it wasn't an agenda about the climate change or uh, air pollution. But now even the Ministry of Environment, they're trying to do something. But in the meantime, the government still believe in the new power plan. This is the, how we see it, because they now want to say that the new power plan will close the old one and there will be less pollution. But one thing we can still see is the way we are, this energy transition, because we must thinking how we produce the energy from coal to renewables and how we consume the energy. This is about the energy efficiency. In Kosovo, two weeks ago, the parliament just wrote the law on energy efficiency that creates the new energy efficiency fund. And now it's something that we will see how we consume the energy. If you see consumption of energy during the summer, in the winter we consume double of energy we consume during the uh, summer. Why? Because we are using energy for heating. We must change that uh, mindset because we will see how to use energy, not for, uh, do, for heating, but to see how to invest more in energy efficiency. And one thing is in, tra in this transition for low carbon, we need to have low co uh, less coal, more uh, uh, renewables. Also, if we, now we are hoping that this data, and also now the government publishing data, not only from Pristina, on other cities where are the big factories, they increase the citizen awareness about the air pollution. And for us as a civil society activists who are fighting against the new power plant about the better uh, low carbon, we will have more allies from the citizen who, are, uh, who, at the end of the day, they vote for this political party. I think this is around five minutes, you told me. Thank you very much, Borim. Um, we'll go next with uh, Dennis. And just before you, you start, Dennis, I would just like to bring something up. Um, so there's often the case and the reason when we were discussing with governments that they are competing with each other who is building more coal and who is not to somehow dominate the energy sector in the region. Uh, in the case of Kosovo, when Kosid was talking to the government by providing arguments and, and reasonable analysis, they were saying, look at the Bosnians because they're building and they're building with Chinese money and there's no, uh, uh, no one is watching them and so on. So do you see that as a case in the region where countries are fighting to dominate the energy sector by uh, investing more in, in fossil fuels and coal? Or is that something, because then we go back to renewables investments with the uh, feeding tariffs and stuff, and we see that there's also corruption and uh, criminal uh, issues uh, involved in there as well. So how do you see the, this whole situation in the Western Balkans, and what could help to go towards an energy transition in the region? Okay. Yeah, the thing is that, yeah, the only new coal power plant in the region was built in Bosnia, and it's the case of Stanari. It was put online, I think, some two years ago, and it was the uh, case where you had a private investor from abroad coming in with the loan from the Chinese banks and Chinese companies and, and building a new, completely new coal power plant in, in, in Bosnia. Uh, that was built for the, uh, again, okay. Okay, so that <laughs> that was a private interest. So that had nothing to do with the actual state plans or whatever. As I said, it's a private private uh, uh, private investment with Chinese money, 
Uh, talking about Bosnia and Bosnia in the region uh, being the only, I think, net exporter of energy, uh, it's not so much a competition between the countries who is going to invest more and who is going to sell more. It's more of the, 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 the logic of having their own energy. So the problem we have in these countries is everyone wants to have their own energy source, to be 100% energy uh, uh, well, sufficient within their borders, which in reality cannot work. So that's, that's where we have a problem. And yeah, of course, they would all love to export and they justify uh, the new uh, investments uh, by having this possibility to, to export it because, well, our politicians usually uh, claim that the energy sector is the backbone of Bosnian economy, which makes absolutely no sense. It should support the Bosnian economy, not be the backbone of the Bosnian economy. But that's, that's what they do, and, and of course, yeah, they have some money from the exports. That's it. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll move there because I have to find the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this will be because I assume that my colleagues will talk about the economy and the coal and transition and everything. I thought it would be a good idea actually to present why we need that urgently. What is happening on the field and that it's not really just the question of energy, energy transition, economy and money. It's actually a question of human lives because this is Tuzla my hometown during the winter. And this is a photo from last winter, basically, where you see down somewhere in that fog and, 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 and smoke from the electricity plant is a town completely covered with smog. And uh, this is the electricity plant we are talking about. It's more or less built within the town limits so it's maybe three, four kilometers from the center of town. So basically in the urban area, you have an electricity plant where the youngest block was built some 40 years ago. So it's an old Russian or Polish technology where actually they did not install quite a bit of uh, pollution prevention measures. So this is how it looks occasionally. Even during the summer, we have the smoke going out. So because people claim it's just during the winter that the, the pollution is there. No, it's there during the summer also. Uh, and these are some statistics on the actual coal mines and coal mining in Bosnia. So we have some 7 million tons of coal, out of which 85% is burned in two coal power plants. Just the Tuzla plant emits between 50 and 70,000 ton tons of SO2 because the situation we have in the Balkans, it's not just specific for Bosnia, it's also all over the Balkans, is that none of the old coal power plants has installed the desulfurization equipment, which is something quite strange for Europe because you don't have a problem like that. But we have, when we have done the analysis and we brought an expert from Europe, he was simply astonished that there is something like this happening on the ground. Uh, beside that, we have this CO2 emissions, which is almost 4 million tons of CO2. But that will be interesting <laughs> later on. Uh, this is the analysis we have done back in 2013 where, with this expert from Europe where we calculated basically that on an annual level, the health costs uh, caused by uh, the pollution, just air pollution, from the electricity plant in Tuzla uh, come up to 99 million euros a year. This was done back in 2013. Nothing has changed in the last five, six years. So up to now, population 
from that area has actually subsidized the price of electricity up to half a billion euros by paying their bills for health costs or the companies which lost uh, working days or whatever when the, when the workers were actually sick because of this air pollution. Not to mention the lives because, I mean, people are dying because of this. This is the actual graph that shows the SO2 limits uh, between 2010 2017, where the annual limit is 50 micrograms per cubic meter. As you can see, most of the time, the limits are above, uh, I mean, the, the, the values are above this limit, and they go up to 800 micrograms. That's the daily average, meaning that hourly average could go even beyond 1,000 or, or, or higher. So here you have the overview of the actual times the limits, hourly limits were breached in this period. And just to clarify why there is a difference between 2012, 13, 14 and the following years, these are the values which were actually calculated based on the validated measurements done by the monitoring stations. In these first three years, the measuring stations were not really measuring properly, so we didn't have all the valid, valid data. And even the, in the following years, we don't have the data for every day in the year. But you can see that actually, according to our law, which we have on that, uh, this should be breached, the limit should be breached 24 times a year. And, well, the record is 2016 with 704 times a year. There were no, absolutely no reactions from the authorities. There were no measures done. Nothing was stopped. Transport was going on. All the factories were working, so no reaction from the authorities. The same thing we have with the PM pollution particulate matter, where you have it almost, well, constantly present, of course, higher during the winters. This is December, well, this is actually January, where I think there was one or two days where we didn't have this uh, uh, limit value breached. So the whole month we were just uh, suffering from this and no reaction again. So. Uh, uh, after that, even um, we are talking about, well, our authorities are claiming that they're going to build a new coal power plant, which is going to replace the two old blocks, three and four, and that that would actually solve the problem of pollution, which is, yeah, acceptable to a certain level. I mean, it would reduce the pollution but the thing is, that's why I mentioned the CO2 emissions. They are trying to replace two blocks with, uh, of 300 megawatts with one block of 450 megawatts. So they would probably reduce the pollution of sulfur dioxide, uh, NOx, and PM, but they would increase the emissions of CO2 emissions uh, for, well, they were almost double, well, one, one, one and a half times would, they would increase the CO2 emissions. So that has nothing to do with decarbonization of, of the energy system, basically. But to forget about the air pollution, we have a huge problem with the actual ash disposal sites of the electricity plant in Tuzla. We have done two studies, one where we have analyzed uh, the presence of heavy metals in food, soil, water, human hair, uh, sediments and whatever. And the other one was based on the actual previous studies. We actually had um, a health impact study where we interviewed the population around, living around these areas where they dispose the ash. And we had some findings where in the first study we found that there is a huge presence of arsenic, cadmium, chrome, and nickel in most of the samples. And in some cases, we also found mercury in the sediment. And the problem is that we have proof by using the hair samples, we have proved that it ended up through whatever 
be it food, water, or, or even breathing, it ended up in, in humans. So we have uh, cases with uh, human samples that contain arsenic, cadmium, and lead. Uh, the conclusion of the health study actually linked the presence of these heavy metals with the uh, uh, various diseases uh, uh, at, in that area. And in some cases, at the end of this thing, you see Divkovici, Plane, Bukinje, and I don't know. Those are the villages located around the ash disposal sites uh, where 41% of the cases, for example, in Divkovici could be linked, be it death or, or, or cancer or whatever, can be linked with the pollution from the ash disposal sites. The problem there is this is the active ash disposal site of PPT Tuzla. Here in the back is actually Tuzla town. They've used a, a valley which forests and everything, agricultural land, they've built a dam and they're dumping the, the, the ash here. And this is how it looks. So one would think that it's a nice beach with blue water and somewhere in the Check. Caribbeans. And basically this color is coming from all the chemicals and heavy metals which are uh, uh, present in this water. They use this water basically to transport the ash. Like so as you can see, there's absolutely no prevention of this water penetrating the underground water. There are no liners, there's absolutely nothing there to prevent it polluting the underground water, the wells in the surrounding area, or whatever, and they claim that that's the European way. They claim, I mean, we have the same thing from the country, they think that's how it's done in Europe, it's following that European practice. I'm not sure that this is the best way to do and practice. Thank you. So, uh, just one... That's one a big one. This is what happens when a living creature ends up in that water. It's dying, basically. No, it's, a, it's a hornet. And, I'm sorry, just one thing. This is what happens with the forest. Again, dying. It's there. Best European standard. And the problem there also we have is when the surface of this ash disposal site dries out, you have wind picking up the dust. So everything that they've collected in filters and whatever, preventing the air pollution by installing some of the filter, filters, all that ends up at the ash disposal site. When it dries out, you have, whoops, no, you have dust. So all this dust actually ends in the surrounding villages, basically killing the people from that area. And going also into Tuzla town, because as I said, Tuzla is just behind this hill. So that's the problem we have in Tuzla. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. I've, uh, I mean, these ima sorry, images are very disturbing, yeah. so please do not let human beings get into the water well, because we, we know what, uh, but we're actually getting it indirectly. So again, just um, uh, before I open uh, the panel for questions and answers, uh, there's an urgent need to actually treat the Western Balkans not as a corridor in the energy sector, but to do something in the Western Balkans, so we're an integral part of planning and strategizing uh, towards uh, accession into the EU. So thank you, all three of you, for your in-depth analysis. And uh, I think we have time for uh, two or three questions, I would say, from the audience. So please, uh, whoever uh, wants to ask something, you're free. No questions or comments, at least uh, from what you have seen or heard. Yes, we have a gentleman. Yeah, my question is on the Chinese power plant. Uh, who were the investors? Were they local investors who got the money from the Chinese, or was it a kind of Chinese-initiated uh, construction? 
Well, it was a businessman from the area which has a company, I think, registered somewhere in the UK. And he got the loan from the Chinese uh, banks, and the Chinese company actually built the, the electricity plant. So that's also something which should be actually mentioned here. Uh, our authorities are claiming that these investments are the biggest investments, well, in Bosnia after the war or whatever, where it will boost the local economy. First of all, they are not, well, biggest Chinese investments, that's what they say. First of all, they are not Chinese investments, they are Chinese loans. And these loans are very conditioned, because that loan in the text says that at least 80%, I think, don't quote me on that, but roughly 80% of the money has to go back in one way or the other to the Chinese companies. So you have a situation with this plant where all the equipment was imported from China, and installed by Chinese workers. So we had some 400 to 500 Chinese workers living at the building site constructing the plant. So that's how they function. So it has nothing to do with boosting local economy. It has nothing to do with boosting uh, local uh, market, labor market. And well, in this case, it was a private investment. But in, in, in the other cases, it would be the state-owned thing where the state would guarantee for that loan. So at the end, when we do not pay off the loan, the people of the country will have to pay that loan. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Uh, Ivana Mjatovic, uh, DG Climate Action. Well, this is not a question. It's more of a comment, um, and it does not really relate to energy investments or climate targets, but more to in environmental uh, a key. And because you are a candidate country, potential candidate country, you are under obligation to align with the a key. So what we saw here is just you know something that it's liable under the uh, environmental impact assessment. And basically, you know, you need to have a permit and you need to align with a permit. So I would think, you know, environmental uh, authorities, environmental is inspection, because this is not how, how you do it uh, uh, in the EU. I mean, this would be closed down immediately and lost a permit. Thank you. Um, just to reply okay. on that. Uh, the fact is that when we send uh, complaints to the inspections, they claim that everything is under the, the actual permit. And in this particular case, for this ash disposal site, the actual environmental permit has expired in May this year and was not renewed yet. So they've been working without an envir valid environmental permit for last, what, six months? And nothing happened. At one point, the ministry s issued some kind of a document stating, okay, they're supposed to work under the conditions of the previous permit until they get the new one. It's, it's an official document. And you saw the conditions on that site, so. Thank you. Please. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Elizabeth George from DG Near, and I'm wondering, uh, with the rise of private investments, particularly from China, is there a, a push or has it opened up discussions for nationalizing or creating some kind of measures to um, draw some limits to dubious um, projects of this type? Thank you. Seems like China is a hot topic right now, so, and, and Bosnia. Yeah, okay. As I said, just to clarify, it's not private investments from China. We are talking about loans from China. China has a lots of money, a lots of equipment produced, and lots of people, well, workers to, to work on that, to export everything. So they're exporting money, labor, and, and, and equipment. And we are going to pay these loans. You know, so it's not private investments. Uh, Sometimes, well, in the case of Stanari, yeah, it was a private investment with the Chinese money. But in other cases, we are talking about the state-owned companies which are planning to build new 
blocks of existing or new coal power plants, where they are going to uh, ask for loans which they would guarantee with the budget of the country, so with our money. Yeah. One more? If I may, uh, as members of the energy community, I think there is an obligation to create national emission reduction plans uh, on sulfur, NOx, uh, particulate matter, etc. Uh, is this somehow influencing the, the situation on the ground, or is it just, uh, let's say, for the future? Well, I, if I may just uh, go here. So often the cases that uh, the obligations that derive from the Secretariat have not been taken seriously by member states in the Western Balkans, thus they have not fulfilled what the obligations that they were supposed to. And this, um, again, the, the national emission standards and the schemes have not been taken quite seriously also from, from member states in this case. Uh, that's why we wanted a stronger uh, political support from the Commission through the Secretariat, which somehow could link the uh, progress of these countries towards the accession uh, strategy. And this, this is something we haven't seen uh, in, in this case, and this is something that we are trying to send a strong political message to the Commission to take this into consideration when they uh, negotiate and discuss with the member states uh, on the accession strategy. Please. Okay. In our case, we have the National Emissions Reduction Plan in Bosnia. It was adopted. And unfortunately, even though it's a good one, it's within the framework of, of NERP and everything, the authorities are using that as an excuse not to install this sulfurization equipment immediately. Because they are now following, or they are referring to the deadlines which are listed in the NERP. So basically, NERP is now being used by them to prolong the process of, of installing some of the equipment because they say we are, our obligation is to do it by 2023 or 27 or whatever. You know, so they're, they're using that just to save time. So I will uh, round up the panel, if I may just uh, reinforce uh, two, three messages what have been said here. Um, so going back to political shift, there's clearly a need for our politicians to shift their mindset towards a sustainable future for our countries. When they draft their energy and, and climate policies and strategies, we clearly see lack of uh, uh, consideration for environment and uh, air pollution and, and so on. Or as often the case, we have strategies which lack implementation as well. So we need, we need to, to work on that. Two is the uh, transition towards uh, uh, renewables and energy efficiency needs to happen, but uh, it needs to be seen from a regional perspective. And in order to, to do that, we need uh, the Western Balkan countries to work together in order to implement something like that. The demand side was also mentioned here as something that we need to take into consideration when we plan for new um, energy uh, sources, which uh, we need to tackle efficiency first before we move on with uh, any production facilities. So again, back to the uh, EU as uh, we invite them to play a more crucial role on this all uh, strategy that we are demanding from them to be stronger and be quite uh, straightforward in demands towards the uh, member states in the Western countries to fulfill their obligations and uh, shift towards a, a decarbonization pathway. Thank you every, everyone for listening and I hope we were able to give you a brief overview and summary on the three Western Balkan countries which are suffering from fossil fuel investments and air pollution and so on. Fossil fuel addiction. Addiction. <laughs> Miriana says addiction, so yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. It was very, uh, I think it was very lively and, and it, it showed not just on an abstract level what's happening in, uh, in Western Balkan, and exactly this, this was our intention, to bring pictures and, and real uh, stories. Uh, so, lady and gentlemen, thank you very much for your contribution.
Uh, and as Vizar said, obviously we are here just to show what EU and Western Balkan and Ukraine, uh, the energy community, can uh, do for each other. And uh, now I'm calling Alexander Matsura. Uh, we are still waiting and expecting uh, Mr. Kopacz to arrive, um, who is the director of the Energy Community Secretariat. But now I have the uh, nice uh, how to say, uh, obligation to introduce uh, uh, Alexander Matsura, who, who has been in the renewable and sustainable energy business for quite some time. Uh, I think we can say that nearly 15 years. So uh, he has a lot to say about the region as such, and we are going to hear from him about the structural problems and the structural obstacles, the structural weaknesses and opportunities uh, laid out uh, by the energy community and the European Union in this manner uh, for Western Balkan. Since we, in the, in the first part of this uh, uh, whole event, we are discussing Western Balkan. Uh, thank you, Ada. I didn't prepare a PowerPoint presentation. I was hoping that I will ride on the presentation of Mr. Kopacz and adjust my presentation <laughs> to what he's going to say, but since he is not here at this moment, I'm going to start, and maybe if Janis joins us later, maybe he will benefit from, from my, uh, my part. <laughs> so I, I would like to start uh, first uh, with a wording that has been used in the treaty on what the energy community is about. And the same wording has been used also in the report that the Euro European Commission submitted to the European Parliament in 2011, assessing the progress at that time of the, of the uh, implementation of the Energy Community Treaty, but also outlining the, 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 their forecast for the future developments and main identifying main challenges. Uh, so what the treaty says and what, what the Commission used in, in, in its report to the Parliament is that the Energy Community is about investments, economic development, security of energy supply, and social stability. But more than this, the energy community is also about so solidarity, mutual trust, and peace. Um, and I think uh, uh, it was very, very valid at the time when the energy community treaty has been signed, which was back in 2005. But I think it's still valid to a certain extent. And uh, I think we must not forgot, forget uh, the framework in which the energy community treaty actually exists. And uh, we can only be able to um, judge on the success of the energy uh, community treaty and the European accession process in the energy sector by also looking at this, at this broader framework. I've mentioned several years here, uh, year 2005, and the treaty has been signed. This was 2011 when the Commission reported to the Parliament. Now we are in 2018. Uh, the treaty entered into, the for into force in 2006, so 12 years uh, before this moment today the treaty entered into, into, uh, into force. We are 12 years from the year 2030. So we are midway from the beginning of the, of the, of the energy community treaty journey uh, to the uh, time horizon of the, of the global and European agendas when this sector is concerned. And I think it can give us uh, some perspective on, on what can be done in 12 years. Uh, whether this was much or, or not what has been done in previous 12 years, uh, it's difficult to say and depends on the perspective and on, on, and on, the, on the angles. And certainly it requires a very thorough evaluation of, of the achievements so far. Maybe it's also interesting to uh, note that not more than 12 years actually uh, took the countries uh, in the region to build the power systems that we know today. Most of the plants that are operational now across the region are, are built more or less in this time frame, maybe a bit longer, but not much longer. So thousands of megawatts have been constructed in some 12 years. So it was possible to, to um, design and implement energy transition in the 70s within 12 years. Okay, the society was a bit differently organized, so the concentration of decision-making power 
uh, was obviously much more dense than it is today, but it was possible. So the power sector that we know today is, has not been created on the sixth day of creation. It's a result of the decision-making processes that occurred in the past. And it was a, a very heavy and very difficult energy transition. But for 40 years, we lived in this energy transition. So I think it tells us that the transitions are possible and the transition are possible in the time frames that we still have until 2030. Uh, so let us repeat once again that the purpose of the energy treaty was economic prosperity and social stability. The energy sector ref reform, creation of a single regional market, its integration into single European market was seen only as a tool to achieve these goals. Uh, and back then, and, and in particular right now, uh, the Energy Community Treaty has not been a single tool for the achievement of these goals. We also have a Central European Free Trade Agreement. We, we see that this agreement is also, at this point in time, facing some difficulties in implementation. But there are different tools which aim to the same goal. And it's impossible to, to uh, judge rightly on the, on the achievements uh, so far in this agenda without understanding all this. Um, what I would also like to underline, I think it's also very important to understand that um, the energy sector reform that is inspired by the, uh, by the participation in the Energy Community Treaty is, I think, I would say, quite different than the, the energy transition that is taking place in the EU. The 2020 policy was clearly nested in the development policy of the European Union. And it's a big, big difference. We have just accepted the goals and targets without actually in the region, in the contracting parties of the energy community, without actually integrating them fully into the development perspectives uh, of the region. And without this integration, it's very difficult to, to judge on the success on the, and on the impact of the energy sector reforms, even if they are fully implemented. You have seen the, the photo that my colleague uh, Mirjana provided. So the Serbian government was having its session in the pit. So this is, this is really a strong message. This is how the government of the Republic of Serbia sees the relevance uh, of that industry. And it must not, be, uh, must not be overlooked. So I think what we are missing and what I hope we will be able to um, achieve in the future period is to increase the ownership over the energy uh, reform, energy sector reform agenda and to really try to communicate, not just to the decision makers and the elites, but also to the citizens, what this reform is about, what it should bring. So rem remember once again, it was economic prosperity, it was social stability. This is what was supposed to be delivered via Energy Community Treaty, using sectoral reforms. Back in 2005, it was just the year when the Kyoto Protocol entered into force. So the climate agenda was not there, not Certainly, it was there, obviously. Kyoto Protocol was a major milestone, and we've been waiting for the ratification for many years, even before 2005. But it wasn't as significant as it is today, and still the Energy Community Treaty was really, really, I think, a major, major breakthrough for the, for the countries in the region. So we are not able at this moment to evaluate what we have achieved um, for the past 12 years. Uh, there are also practical reasons. For example, um, as, as, uh, as uh, Buirim uh, pointed, we don't know uh, what is the air quality. We are not always certain what is the air quality uh, uh, in, the, in the countries where we live. Uh, we are not certain what are the emissions coming from those chimneys, although this is improving and I think it's across the region, some continuous monitoring um, is in place, but we are not able to um, to be 100% sure about some objective indicators on the status, for example, of the environment, uh, which is obviously necessary also to see whether the uh, Energy Community Treaty and the EU accession were effective as a process that should deliver environmental uh, benefits. So there are other weaknesses in our societies which prevent us to fully exploit the potential of these of these agendas. Uh, we have received a question on the, on the national emission reduction plan from the gentleman in the fourth row, I think. And um, the deadline is this year. I mean, and this has been mentioned in the report uh, from the commission to the parliament in 2011. Uh, the commission said, okay, let's see what's going to happen by December 2017. So December 2017 was 11 years ago and we would certainly hear a lot more about it from Mr. Kopac, but we will hear later on uh, uh, about the views of the Secretariat. 
uh, but the deadline, and that was really the cutoff date, and as Mr. Kopach says and, and, and the Secretariat says, this is the beginning, if I rightly remember, the second transition in the energy community. So the 2018, for example, in Serbian NERP that has been submitted to the Secretariat, are reductions in sulfur dioxide emissions for this year, not some year in the future, have to be from four to 16 times comparing to the current emissions. It's obviously not going to happen, and it's not going to happen in any of the of the contracting parties this year. Whether and when will this happen, we don't know. There is also a, another example in the environmental impact assessment study for desulfurization in one of the Serbian plants. The authors say that even the, the denitrification measures that have already been put in place were not sufficient to lower the emissions of nitrogenous oxides below the allowed threshold. And this we also know from the past, that the, due to technological constraints, even that target will be difficult to achieve, even though it's a cheaper one. So we still have, are facing some, um, some obstacles. On the way here, I was reading three weekly Serbian newspapers, and I think it's for the first time, in all three of them, the energy community has been mentioned. Um, and the recent developments, um, uh, inspired by the, by the protests on, on small hydro, actually initially brought some bad publicity to the energy community, but, you know, as communicators will say, there is no such a thing as a bad publicity, but thanks to the reactions from the Secretariat and then their rightly statements, I would say that now, for the first time, the energy community is with the citizens, at least in Serbia. They kind of heard about it, and they seem to like what is being offered to them um, through this tool. I think this is also very, very important to communicate this agenda to the regular citizen, because if the she or, or he faces the renewable energy development as the drying of the river by which they live, it's not going to uh, be very favorable for the development of the, of the energy transition. What would be great is if these type of, uh, of tools like the accession or the energy community are able to deliver um, prevention measures like that, as uh, Ivan also rightly pointed, that environmental impact assessment works in practice so that we don't have to have a protest uh, before, uh, after the, the uh, detrimental construction already um, took place. But for that we need to work. Uh, what is perhaps also a future channel or, or, or outlook of the Energy Community Treaty or some other tools, in its statement I think the Secretariat says, offered also a a kind of a um, um, service of bringing the stakeholders together. So we are having here also a governance issues because if, if the first time you learn about the, the project is when you see the excavation work in the riverbed, it's definitely too late. So there are some uh, deficiencies in the, in the governance frameworks in all contracting parties um, in the region. Uh, I think this year uh, was also marked by the, by the communication on the credible enlargement perspectives document. Uh, for me, at least, it was really uh, an important document, and I was very uh, encouraged by the text there. But it's nine months since the, the, the publish, publishing of this document, and it seems that the general environment uh, around this document is somehow uh, controversial, and it, it doesn't seem to be um, a solid ground uh, uh, for the future developments, although we would like to see. The energy community there is underlined as a very important tool in achieving different objectives. And also what is very important is that the energy union has been announced. There are sentences there clearly saying that the Western Balkans is uh, expected to accept energy union even without the accession. So through the energy community treaty or some other mechanism. And I think the wording was also all five pillars, which clearly says that the decarbonization is also um, something that the countries in the region should adhere to. So what would be the purpose of the, of the future transition? I would repeat once again, the purpose should be the economic prosperity, the economic development, but also the social stability. What I frequently hear in Serbia, and I think perhaps it's common also to other contracting parties, is people uh, from the government saying, we don't need development strategy, we are in the accession <coughs> process, so this is equal to the development. I can imagine numerous scenarios in which obligations uh, uh, regarding the energy sector reform are fulfilled without any development, even with detrimental outcomes for the development. 
but many more scenarios in which development uh, outcomes are positively influenced by the accession. So what I want to say is that the accession process cannot be, cannot replace development strategies. Uh, and I think it's perhaps good that uh, the European Commission and even the Energy Community Treaty perhaps somehow communicate this notion to the, uh, to the contracting, contracting parties. Um, Visser rightly pointed, and also other panelists, I think that the regional cooperation is a must in, in achieving the goals of the energy transition. But we see today that even CEFTA agreement that has been uh, working for many, many, many years is facing difficulties. So we also have to be uh, realistic that the politicians today probably won't jump into the offer to you know, procure uh, energy security from uh, you know, the neighboring uh, jurisdictions. So the trust that has been mentioned in the beginning is obviously extremely important and the trust cannot be built solely by the energy sector reform. It can be sometimes even undermined if the reform is not properly. So it is also about human rights, I would say, and public goods. Uh, January 2017, I think it was in Dennis' presentations. In Serbia, mortality in January 2017 was 50% higher than in January 2016. I think it's a violation of major human rights, a right to live. Uh, in Macedonia, average household heats 37 square meters. In Kosovo, 50% of respondents in the survey of income and living consumption say, conditions say that they cannot afford sufficient warmth. This is all about human rights, and this is all about energy sector reform at the same time. Important distinctive feature between the region and the European Union is the share of non-network energy in household consumption. I always repeat that. It's very high in our region. Share of network energy in household consumption is less than 50% in the region. This is really something that we have to have in mind when talking about the energy sector reform. What I think are, are, are some challenges that lie ahead uh, is that uh, the way I see it, uh, uh, the countries in the region will seek also to arbitrage between the two regulatory frameworks, the Energy Community Treaty and the Accession. They think they might negotiate better deals from the perspective of, of executive powers in the Accession framework comparing to, to the, to the uh, obligations already uh, agreed within the framework of the Energy Community Treaty. I don't think this would... Uh, be beneficial for the, for the human rights or the public goods of the citizens uh, in the region, but I think we already see this type of, of attempts. What I also think is that we have a very, very uh, a good coordination uh, in the reporting, at least, if nothing else. So there has to be a cross-cutting exercise across the chapters. You know, this energy sector reform and its outcomes are, they live in numerous different chapters. The chapter on the rule of law, for example, in European reports, should contain some reflections on the status of implementation of the Energy Community Treaty. There has to be a message sent to the governments and all others who read the report, whether they are performing good on this or not performing good on this. We haven't seen that uh, in the past. Uh, what are possible options? I think it would be good if we have another stock-taking exercise by the Commission and a report to the Parliament. Maybe it's ongoing, I don't know. Uh, but this could be a good thing. So to take another stock, to look back, 12 years have passed, 12 years are separating us from 2030 and, and the goals of the 2030 policies. Let's take a look what has happened so far. What perhaps couldn't be also good, maybe it's uh, blasphemy to say this in the, in, the, in the premises of the Commission, but also that the Commission and even the energy community somehow embarrass, uh, embraces the 2030 UN agenda. Because I, I, I really believe that uh, the reforms of the energy sector in line with the, with the clean energy package could actually be very, very beneficial to the development agenda that has been agreed by all the countries in the world the Sustainable Development uh, Goals Agenda. Uh, and this could be communicated to the governments and to the people also in the region. And maybe just, uh, uh, and this is where I'm going to end, uh, uh, a few uh, bullet points on something that I see as a no regret measures and maybe less controversial or easier measures that could, if nothing else, increase the ownership over the energy sector reform. A covenant of mayors is a convenient tool for uh, uh, energy planning at the local level. It, it also integrates uh, uh, an issue of energy poverty, which is a very important issue for the uh, 
parties to the Energy Community Treaty and the issue that has been mentioned by the by the Mr. Benedek, if I remember correctly, in the beginning. Uh, uh, there is some developments, there are some developments in this respect, but I think it would be good if, if um, uh, DGs in charge could perhaps boost the, the usage of this kind of a pooling tool uh, and uh, uh, energy and climate planning at the local level with integrated energy poverty and integrated adaptation planning. Uh, if it's uh, uh, more proliferated in the region, I, if nothing else, I, I would say it would uh, help increasing ownership over the energy sector. Uh, reform. What I also see is the, the good direction is the continuing, continued involvement of national parliaments. If we are going to face a regional targeting exercise in the future, which is thing that needs a really very sensitive approach, I think it changes the matter of the treaty. We agreed all the, the parliaments of the, uh, of the contracting parties agreed in 2006 that they are uh, giving part of their sovereignty to the bodies of the energy community treaty because new legislation can enter enter this universe without parliaments reverting to them directly. But if we switch to regional obligations and regional responsibilities, I think we should go back to the parliaments and ask them what they think about this, because this is really a major change. Uh, and I believe this would be important if we, if, we, if we do involve parliaments once again. The continued engagement with the civil society, we are kind of beneficiaries of that engagement, but what, what the real beneficiaries should be the citizens. And I believe that our cooperation with the Secretariat, uh, a lot of people present here uh, are cooperating with the Secretariat, could actually really be beneficial for, for the implementation of this agenda with the view on its impact on the economic uh, development and uh, social stability. And uh, we really have to, to do our best in the contracting parties and with the support, hopefully, from the, from the European Commission and the Energy Community Treaty, as Mr. Benedek also pointed out in the beginning, to really avoid lock-in and avoid imposed transitions. We have seen imposed transitions in the past 30 years in the region, and they really cost a lot. And I think it would be of vital importance if we, if we miss the next imposed transition and, and uh, and uh, really implement these transition with a sense of ownership and with the view of the context in which we live. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, yes, we have heard that transition has a very bad and kind of negative connotation in, uh, in Western Balkans. So, well, but now, thank you for your contribution. Uh, I think we would come back to to discuss it if if uh, we have a moment and but we are behind the schedule very much uh, in the meantime, Mr. Kopach has arrived as far as I could see, so I would like to welcome him uh, on stage <laughs> so to say um, he has been the director of the energy uh, Community Secretariat for the last six years, but as far as I could see, he was one of the first uh, and youngest <laughs> Minister of Finance, probably in the <laughs> early 90s, for a little, sh for, for a short period of time. Um, the floor is yours, and uh, and uh, you have only 15 minutes. I have seen your slides, which are very extensive, so probably you you might want to think about where to cut it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Th thanks for this introduction. Uh, thanks for this introduction. I, I, don't be, I don't promise I will be only 15 minutes long. <laughs> uh, but let, let's go fast through. Um, can you? Uh, so this is a map of energy community. Uh, EU is only one member. All these light blue countries are other members, or we call them contracting parties. And uh, uh, energy community was created to to um, to be one internal energy market. Uh, but is it true? Uh, of course, the answer is no. Uh, but uh, I will show you through the presentation. Please go on. Uh, uh, the challenges which I see in the region, not only Western Balkans, also Ukraine, uh, Moldova and Georgia, uh, 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 I mean, the, the 
challenges are several. The first one is uh, resistance to establish electricity market in all our contracting parties. Um, and this is a vicious circle. Uh, in this uh, vicious circle, there are some stakeholders who, of course, have profit uh, because, or have benefits because the markets are closed. And uh, 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 inside energy community already and in neighborhood with EU, it's possible to have liberalized markets, functioning markets, uh, but of course then uh, some incumbents or some uh, vested interests are not fulfilled. And this has always a major implication on political activities. Ministers are not uh, um, very brave to, to change anything uh, because uh, then some demonstrations happen and so on and so on. Uh, I will not go into details, uh, but uh, uh, all this uh, creates problems by itself and it is never solved. Um, so uh, when we talk about internal energy market and uh, the question, is it really? It's not really. Already a key which we have, and we have third energy package in gas, in electricity, renewables directive, energy efficiency directive, energy performance of buildings directive, energy labeling directive, or now it's regulation, oil stocks directive. So all this is uh, our a key. It's the same as in EU. Uh, but this is implementation index. You see, that in electricity, let's say the best is Montenegro, uh, somewhere on 60, a little bit more percent. Um, but in many other uh, areas, uh, all our contracting parties are well beyond 100 percent. Also, EU is not perfect. You have also countries like Bulgaria, Romania, with some uh, Greece with some implementation gap, but not that big one as it is in our contracting parties. Um, uh, we uh, we are preaching about regional cooperation, opening the markets, and so on and so on, uh, for a long time. This is a study, I think it's from 2015 or 2016, which showed really, it was proven, that uh, benefits for electricity consumers uh, only in Western Balkans would be more than 270 million annually if the markets would be liberalized. Um, then uh, national authorities usually say, oh, traders would have profit, not really consumers. Uh, this is partially true, uh, but primarily uh, it is uh, if you really open the market, then on the end, traders have competition and the real benefit benefiters are uh, consumers. Um, uh, if we compare uh, EU and energy community contracting parties, uh, not only that implementation is not the same, but also circumstances are not the same. Uh, our, so we are pushing our contracting parties, uh, now I'm a little bit uh, sorry for them saying this, you see this tiny arrow with the rule of law, uh, a little bit with donors coordination, uh, some conditionality by uh, international financial institutions, but on the other side they have a, a huge burden of not liquid markets, of uh, uh, very high country risks. I'm talking about investments into renewables. For example, wind turbine in uh, Western Balkans or in Ukraine costs exactly twice as much as wind turbine in Germany because the country risk is so high and this has such an influence on, on um, uh, capital costs. And uh, uh, we have years uh, of regulated, heavily regulated markets with very low prices, and there is no, not enough uh, investment potential in the energy sector by itself. Um, so this was about, uh, uh, this could be solved on a national level. Countries are guilty by themselves because they don't go more into um, reforms. But then there we have another reason why EU and uh, energy community part of the internal uh, energy market are not the same. And this is a legal gap. Uh, uh, this legal gap, uh, so our contracting parties are obliged to respect third energy package between them or among themselves. So uh, Ukraine towards Moldova or Serbia towards Bosnia or and so on. But on the other side, EU member states are not 
obliged to respect third energy package on the border with energy community contracting parties. So they are treated like third countries, like Angola. Um, and uh, they are officially members of the same internal energy market. Uh, this is not fair. Uh, and uh, this causes also very many problems. And these problems are, uh, uh, I will not go into details because I, have, I don't have enough uh, time. Uh, but uh, these problems are uh, becoming a problem also for EU, not only for energy community contracting parties. One of them is carbon leakage. Um, in the past, this was not a big problem because uh, carbon prices were low, but now they are becoming much higher and carbon leakage will start to happen uh, inside internal energy market um, because you have two legal regimes. Um, then uh, a lot of a key which is important for functioning of the market is missing. State aid a key, competition a key. Uh, we have some provisions in the treaty, but not, not a directive. VAT, Value Added Tax Directive, uh, is not obligatory on the territory of energy community contracting parties, and so on and so on. And then things, problems are popping up. A few of them I listed there in, in red. Uh, for example, uh, a new coal power plant in Kosovo. It's clear violation of any state, possible state aid rules. Uh, and... Uh, uh, state aid authorities in Kosovo are not functioning, uh, and it is not part of e uh, energy community aki. Uh, we started an infringement procedure. We made a big problem because World Bank then gave up uh, after our letter, uh, but uh, so they are not going to finance it. But uh, the project is still alive, and so on. I will not go into details. There is so the fact is there is a gap, legal gap. Inside one market, we have two regimes, and this doesn't function well. Um, and um, I, I tried to present this legal gap. So we have a holy triangle, renewables, energy efficiency, CO2 emissions. And uh, energy community has, uh, is covering only two angles, not the third one. So we have renewables directive, we have three energy efficiency directives, but we don't have uh, ETS directive. Governance regulation will hopefully come, and we don't have other uh, climate aki yet. Uh, a little bit helps us what Alexander Matsura previously discussed or uh, explained: a large combustion plants directive and in industrial emissions directive. These two are relevant in energy community, and they help also in this achieving climate issues because indirectly influence but otherwise not. And you can see there, it's uh, with relative small letters, EU had 20, 20, 20 for 2020. We had a little bit less, 20 for energy efficiency, 15 for renewables, zero for CO2. And in uh, 2030, Europe is already well advanced. EU, in our contracting parties, who knows what will happen because of missing a key. Next one. Uh, this is uh, carbon leakage will happen because of the rising prices. It's just to illustrate. Uh, here, uh, I will not go into details, but this is a presentation how uh, energy efficiency, then later renewables and CO2 uh, targets could be designed in the energy community. But for, uh, I know, uh, we have to go on. This is about renewables. So if we would have the same approach as EU, this would be target in energy community contracting parties. Um, and uh, in a week from now, we will have a ministerial council. We, as secretariat, proposed uh, policy guidelines which are, have the same approach for renewables, for CO2, and for energy efficiency as it is in EU. It's written same ambitious. Um, okay, it's a little bit politically blurry language. Uh, but this would mean uh, in practice for our contracting parties. Um, uh, it will not be easy for them. You see what is happening currently. There are some contracting parties which are well beyond their target, Montenegro, even Bosnia, but there are some contracting parties which are well behind. Um, Serbia, uh, the worst is Ukraine. Uh, Kosovo also has uh, huge problems. And now, if we top them up with 
uh, equally ambitious approach as it is in EU, uh, they will have very heavy times uh, from now till 2030. Um, uh, this is EU's approach to, for lowering CO2 emissions, so 40% till 2030. And here we have a problem. These are emissions in our contracting parties. Uh, Ukraine is not present here. I mean, it's another graph. The, this upper line is Serbia. So Serbia is constantly lowering emissions, but uh, all the other Western Balkan countries, which are down there, are slowly growing with CO2 emissions. And if we would have the same approach, so 40% less uh, in 2030, this would be, uh, I mean, this, uh, this wouldn't be possible because EU has a constant decrease uh, in CO2 emissions. Here you have a constant increase, except in Serbia. And this, uh, uh, we simply cannot have the same ambitious approach. Uh, so uh, this is a methodology which we proposed as secretariat, and it will be discussed by ministers. It wouldn't be so ambitious as it is EU because it simply doesn't work. Um, but uh, we would stay somewhere between uh, uh, zero in some cases, even with a little bit increase of CO2 emissions till 2030, but in general would be much more ambitious than um, NDC uh, currently from these contracting parties. Um, but this is just to present that we also have now integrated energy and climate plans like EU, only EU has them till the end of this year, we have them till the end of 2020, and some contracting parties are really seriously working on them. Uh, Macedonia, Albania, also Kosovo, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the others, uh, and Ukraine, I have to say, very seriously. Uh, the others hopefully will follow. So these are next steps, um, uh, how uh, we will transpose the clean energy package Hopefully by November next year, we will have it as well, like EU has it or will have it now in the next weeks. Um, this was about legal gap. Then uh, we have a special problem which EU doesn't have, fossil fuel subsidies versus renewable subsidies. Uh, here is a presentation of uh, fossil fuel subsidies in only in Western Balkan six countries, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, is here missing. Uh, you see that, for example, Kosovo is investing one third of GDP into coal subsidies or fossil fuel subsidies, not only coal. Uh, if all this money would go into subsidies for renewables, Western Balkans or energy community would be completely different. But uh, it's politically sensitive because of miners, because of um, uh, trade unions in general, and because of a very, very uh, well-present coal industry, coal-related industry in uh, the country. Uh, but this is unfortunately investment of the future into the past, uh, and it is much more intensive than in EU. Um, uh, here is a list of uh, forms of fossil fuel subsidies, but if somebody is interested, can read later. Um, another problem which we have uh, is high country risk. Uh, I already um, uh, mentioned it. Um, this is uh, um, Agora's uh, presentation of EU's problems, where you see Greek uh, risk is 11%, um, uh, German one is, I think, two and a half, uh, something like this. And uh, in our contracting parties, it is even worse than in Greece. So you can see how much uh, investment into renewables cost, much more than in EU. And EU is now thinking about risk mitigation scheme, which would be financed by EU budget, and here, our contracting parties simply cannot uh, improve the situation without assistance of EU. So uh, our proposal of Secretariat is, um, uh, we, we told it to Commission several times, please 
extend the risk mitigation scheme also to energy community contracting parties. Otherwise, we cannot function uh, this, with the dynamics which is needed to remain on the same internal energy market. Uh, this is just a presentation of these uh, changes. So you see this uh, big bar. This would be wind turbines if the uh, costs of country risk would be similar as in Germany. Uh, and the, the very red area down there is reality. So you see the, the difference between potential and reality. Um, uh, another uh, problem which we have in all our contracting parties, except now in Albania, are expensive feed-in tariffs. Um, here is uh, a table. You cannot see all these numbers because they are small. Uh, but I can tell you that, for example, in Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, they still subsidize uh, photovoltaics with 272 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, at the same time, you have a bright case of Albania, which two weeks ago finished its first auction for feed-in tariffs. They started with 100 euros per megawatt hour, and they ended with 59. Um, uh, one Indian company won. Uh, so it's possible, also in energy community contracting parties, but political will has to be present. So everybody shall urgently introduce auctions because uh, feed-in tariffs are simply too high, and then uh, everybody rejects investments into renewables because they are afraid that consumers will bankrupt. And if somebody can come in, can come in only because he knows uh, personally uh, some politicians very well. Um, and this, of course, kills the whole investment climate into renewables. Uh, otherwise, the most critical uh, state is Ukraine, uh, which has enormously high feed-in tariffs, and investments are really happening there. But this will cost Ukrainian consumers much more than needed. Um, uh, next problem which we have is underestimated state aid. Um, I have only one slide. Uh, uh, the, you see, this is the electricity market price, uh, the electricity price in Hupex. Uh, so, I'm for our relevant for our region for last year, and you see it's somewhere 50, 45, 50, 55 euros per megawatt hour. Depends on the day. Um, over there is presentation of the price of Kosovo C, new lignite uh, coal power plant, which uh, Kosovo government uh, signed already, with, and they promised state guarantee uh, to American investor. Uh, and this, uh, so they, they, guarantee, they will guarantee um, a price 80 euros per megawatt hour for next 20 years. Uh, and somebody will have to pay this difference. And this somebody are, of course, taxpayers of Kosovo. And taxpayers of Kosovo don't have that much money to pay this for 20 years. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I often say that this would be a bankruptcy of a state of Kosovo. Um, but uh, uh, thanks God, Parliament didn't ratify this state guarantee yet. And uh, hopefully they will not. Uh, because even World Bank, who was long for years promising they will finance this coal power plant, and now they stepped out because we started uh, a state aid procedure, uh, um, they offered alternative project, wind, uh, solar, plus batteries, which would be cheaper and would bring the same energy. But now government didn't decide yet will they go into it or, ne or not, the, because uh, at least uh, the, the main politicians are still pushing for this project. Um, and then um, the last uh, uh, challenge, uh, um, I see that I wrote Western Balkans. This was from another presentation. I, th I, I mixed something, but it doesn't matter. It's relevant also for Ukraine, um, um, which is present today. No job transformation policy at all. Um, and this is a big problem. Also, Europe has this problem. OK, now Commission started with coal regions in transition. It's a very good initiative. 
It would be good if our contracting parties would be part of it as well. Only Ukraine is invited, nobody else. Uh, Macedonia was, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia was interested, and we brought them in as representatives of the Energy Community Secretariat. This was possible. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> but uh, otherwise, uh, they are not uh, involved into this, and I think um, um, the politicians are even not aware how to how to start dealing with this enormous problem because there are the whole regions of miners and uh, industry which is uh, coal related and nobody really systematically deal with the vision how to how to come out of this um, yeah this was just uh, you know uh, miners in our region are still national heroes uh, and uh, they're uh, they're I mean, politicians are praising them, you know, and I mean, as persons, they're okay, but uh, profession is the wrong one. Uh, so I wrote uh, a few uh, uh, actions or which we propose. So there are two slides. One is for our contracting parties. The next one is for EU. Um, uh, what would bring us into more sustainable future? So first, make electricity regional. It means liberalize national markets. If Kosovo would open its market, they would have electricity now for 50 euros per megawatt hour. They don't need to plan something for 80 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, we should kick EU to unite internal energy markets. So to propose all this missing a key, which is a serious thing. Uh, uh, we as Secretariat cannot do it. Only Commission can do it uh, um, because our treaty allows that existing acquis can be proposed for transposition only by the Commission. Um, so then next one is name them, don't fame them. I mean, uh, mining. Uh, um, uh, so fossil fuel subsidies are, should become transparent. Um, this is the, the slide which you saw a little bit earlier. I showed some months ago to Claude Turmes, and uh, this, was, this resulted in his request that in uh, um, integrate in EU um, governance regulation, um, the fossil fuel subsidies are requested, I mean, presentation of them is requested as well. And this will become relevant in our contracting parties as well when we will adopt governance regulation. Hopefully, the Commission will propose it very soon. And uh, uh, then we shall really uh, make this public, how much money goes into fossil fuel subsidies and compare this with money which goes into renewables and energy efficiency measures. Uh, uh, fourth measure is our action, make renewables financially sustainable, not only environmentally sustainable. So we have to lower the, uh, the support scheme, I mean to, to make it cheaper, and it's possible. Uh, we shall save taxpayers' money f uh, to redu uh, for, uh, through reducing feed-in tariffs with auctions. Uh, we shall, uh, uh, of course, have lower cost of capital. We shall. Uh, where we expect European support, EU support, we shall uh, fight against state aid, and we shall uh, uh, offer renewables and energy efficiency as an opportunity for job transition. Uh, I mean, for, for the uh, uh, new job creation activity, which would replace uh, existing jobs in uh, fossil fuel related activities and of course everything should be based on the rule of law because only this helps uh, even in our contracting parties and then there is the next slide actions which we at least secretariat expect from eu uh, first is energy community treaty amendments we are our contracting parties agreed with them two years ago but EU still didn't get a mandate, Commission didn't get a mandate from EU to start discussing them. Um, and uh, treaty amendments are important to strengthen the rule of law in our contracting parties, so to impose fines and such things. Our contracting parties, ministers agreed with all this, but EU didn't agree yet. Uh, 
Then new key, which I mentioned, VAT directive, um, um, state, uh, so ETS uh, directive and so on. Then we shall have a pan-European risk management scheme. I talked about it, will not repeat. Uh, we shall involve uh, contracting parties in these different EU platforms like co-regions in transition. Uh, uh, coordination of donors or, uh, uh, shall, shall be much better because there is a lot of EU money which goes into different activities which are sometimes uh, not aligned. Uh, and uh, also EU money shall be conditioned with uh, uh, respecting the rule of law. Uh, this is the case, for example, in macrofinancial assistance to Ukraine. The, it's very conditioned, but in Western Balkans, sometimes we say, you shall condition, you know, this, uh, otherwise they, they will not follow. Uh, this conditioning is, is politically sensitive in Brussels. Uh, but uh, I think it's good to talk with the clear language. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, how EU side could assist in improving or uh, achieving more sustainable future. And of course, I hope that EU will also support Secretariat in all its endeavors. Uh, I have to say that uh, in uh, si seven days or six days we have Ministerial Council and we still don't know, uh, we, we still don't have uh, proposals from European Commission about uh, our future. Uh, including the team of the Energy Community Secretariat, but hopefully it will be it will function. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, now I, I think it uh, was a very good uh, compilation and uh, summary of, or not summary. It's like a comprehensive overview of what um, the energy community can bring into and what more it could be, uh, might be bringing into, into, the, into this region. Now, we have a very uh, limited time until four o'clock when, uh, when we probably have to leave this room. Okay. Okay, so we have a little bit of a, um, a time uh, leverage here. So, uh, but now we would uh, turn to, to Ukraine, and I would like to ask you to, to stay here, remain here, and I would like also ask uh, Alexander and uh, Colin Wolf to, to come on uh, next to me, and then we would be uh, probably speed up a little bit the, uh, the last the finale of, uh, of our event. Uh, now, Irina is uh, going to talk about uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, opportunities for low carbon transition. She is uh, a well-known expert uh, in Ukraine of sustainable energy. Uh, so I would like to give the floor to her. Thank you very much, Ada. Um, uh, can we please have my slides on? Yeah, thank you. You can see it on it. I would like to, uh, well, I have a <laughs> rather challenging task now in 10 to 15 minutes describe in general uh, the situation with the progress and the challenges that we have in Ukraine in terms of um, in terms of the transition and in terms of the framework that the association agreement and uh, the energy community treaty is giving us and I would like to start with the saying that actually it is the association agreement and uh, the energy community treaty these are the two main things that are really shaping the environment in ukraine uh, the environment in which the reforms are happening including of course in the energy and the climate policy basically these are uh, the two documents that um, 
whatever, let's say, whatever the progress we have in energy and the, the climate policy now uh, for the last five years is uh, largely due to, to the fact that we have this agreement and that we have these obligations and that we have this, this being a main driver, let's say, for the, for the positive uh, progress that we have so far. So uh, please, can we go to the next slide? I will try to really briefly go through the different areas um, where we have some progress and where we also have the challenges. So some of them was already mentioned but by Mr. Kopach very nicely. So um, in countries like Ukraine, and I'm sure it is also very relevant uh, for the Western Balkans, um, the energy efficiency should go first. Um, this is something that we always, uh, that we always repeat and we very much hope that sometime soon that will uh, become a kind of the priority message that our government would also start to repeat. Um, so far, we've been successful as a country, let's say, in adopting some of the key laws. These are the ones uh, on energy performance in buildings and on commercial heat metering and billing. And um, also, the other thing is that we finally had the State Energy Efficiency Fund established, which already benefits from the, uh, from the contribution from EU and from also from the German government. But when we see later in the challenges, we still have the challenge to basically make sure that the implementation of these laws uh, is, is actually happening, um, as well with this, uh, the State um, Energy Efficiency Fund. Um, and the second one is, the, of course, the reform of electricity market. And I must say that this is the area that seems to attract most of the attention when, <laughs> when the discussions in Ukraine are happening around the energy community and around the obligations. And we do have the law on electricity market adopted, but there are still a lot uh, that is being discussed now on uh, how we really make it function. And there is a lot of debates and there is a lot of challenges. And this is mainly due, of course, as Mr. Kopach mentioned uh, earlier, due to the high resistance to opening up the market and to making real, like establishing the real market, which we don't have so far. Next one, please. Um, in renewable energy, of course, we do have the National Renewable Energy Plan with the target which is set at the, le at the level of 11% renewables in the final energy consumption by uh, 2020. So far, um, after we have this, uh, the law on the, green, on the green tariff, we managed to, as a country, we managed to in install around 1,200 megawatt of new renewables, but um, as far as the, the percentage of the electricity, it's only 1.5, roughly, percent of the electricity production. And yes, we are very lagging behind uh, on our pathway to reaching our goal to, uh, to reach 11 percent by 2020. And there are a number of uh, obstacles for that, of course, is, and one of them is uh, the investment climate. And of course, um, the second one, as we see it as environmental organization, is that uh, whenever developments we have is the developments on the large scale. It's a, a large-scale commercial projects, and we do have uh, we don't have enough support schemes for uh, development of renewables on the on the other levels, on the level of community-based projects, on the level of uh, municipality projects. Um, uh, and, and so on. But the positive thing is that uh, in 2015, the feed-in tariff was extended to also cover the private uh, households. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, by now we have more than 5,000 households in Ukraine that already use this opportunity. So kind of starting from 2015, the opportunities of renewable energy are coming close a little bit to, to, the, to the consumers, to the people. Um, in terms of uh, environment, um, because it was among of the, um, because it was part of the association agreement and also uh, one of the requirements on the energy community, community treaty, we finally have the laws on strategic environmental impact assessment and the law on environmental impact assessment adopted. And at the end of 2017, the implementation has started finally and we now go through the, basically the first set of 
this uh, EIA procedures, but uh, for now it's too early to judge, I would say, how successful is this model that is being introduced because we still haven't have kind of, you know, enough uh, of this EIA is being done to, to really see um, how effective is the process and what needs to be changed to make it the function better. Um, yeah. Maybe this one also uh, important to, to mention when we speak about um, also the subsidies to, 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 the, uh, to the fossil fuels. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, there is some progress uh, in this area. After 2014, there was a tremendous drop in direct subsidies to coal mining, in, to the state coal mining in Ukraine. And, uh, you see the the orange uh, the orange one is the direct subsidies and the the blue one these are kind of the money that should have been used for a rehabilitation and then later for the liquidation of the mine but as far as it goes now this money is still just used for the functioning of the mines and not no, there is not really a process that uh, would uh, comprehensively um allow us to work on, on closing down the old mines and uh, transforming the regions uh, that are now really very much coal dependent. Next one, please. So as I touched upon the challenges a little bit, uh, we do have the primary uh, legislation adopted on energy efficiency, but the implementation is uh, lagging behind. The energy efficiency fund is not yet operational, but there are uh, processes ongoing to set up the fund and we very much hope that the next year it will start uh, making operational. We know that the European Commission is uh, paying a lot of attention and uh, putting a, a lot of efforts in uh, helping, in helping um, Ukrainian authorities to make sure that this will start op being operational next year. And this graph, uh, just to show you how uh, much, um, how much energy intensity, how high is energy intensity uh, in Ukraine so far? Uh, this is like the, the the highest column is this basically what we had in 2015, um, and the second column is our goal for 2020, and the third column is our goal, the current goal that is set in the energy strategy for 2035. So you can see that even according to the goals we have in 2035, we can be, uh, <laughs> we can be at the level which is higher than Poland had already in 2015. So we still have a, a huge potential which is not tapped and even our goals that we have in our view are still not ambitious enough to really uh, and they need to be, um, and they need to be more ambitious. Next one. Um, yeah, we've talked today about uh, the LCPD directive and its implementation in Western Balkans. In Ukraine, we have additional, uh, well, additional challenge because the deadline for Ukraine to implement this it's not 2018 but 2033, as was negotiated um, in our case, and so far. We see uh, not much progress, um, including we see no progress in uh, setting up the financial mechanism to finance the environmental uh, modernizations at the thermal power plants. Um, and as also Mr. Kopech mentioned earlier, there is no plans, there is no thinking in the politicians' mind and in the ministry on what shall we do with these coal dependent regions, how should we transform them, uh, what will be the, like, the future, what will be the new jobs, and, and so on and so on. And we have two regions, the, the biggest one is in Donbass, of course, you know, and we also have the small one in the western Ukraine, which, where, where the same challenges apply. Um, yeah, we also talked to today about uh, about CO2 emissions. Um, just to tell you that uh, the current uh, national uh, determined contribution for Ukraine basically allows the rise of emission from the current level. Not to say it doesn't provide the basis for the reduction, it even allows the CO2 emissions to rise. So this is uh, one of the things that we really looking into uh, to 
for the necessity to, for the process to, to revise it. And this process is being kind of planned for the next year to start. And we also see that there is the, um, a role and there is a kind of agreement that uh, the EU, the European Commission and the institutions will be looking into helping Ukraine to go about this uh, process to make sure that the new NDC we have will be much more ambitious and actually provide for some, um, for some CO2 emission reductions. Again, renewables, um, uh, Mr. Kopech raised this uh, already. We have a very high feed-in tariff, but uh, the current scheme will actually, according to the law, end in 2030. And of course, there is a high risk for, uh, for the new investments because there is this uncertainty what's going to be after 2030. And there is this discussion about uh, transformation and about transition to the auction system. Um, I guess um, the good pro the progress was uh, last year is that we the really the discussion on transition to action uh, to auctions was basically opened up from the very beginning and it really involved uh, a lot of different act actors including NGOs and including the um, uh, the businesses the, the associations of the renewable businesses and um, well. We can hope that uh, the final draft law that will be um, that will be taken and brought to the parliament that it will actually um, take into account all the considerations because there are still a lot of uh, concerns how the scheme will be set up to to really ensure that there will be a competition and that the different players can be. Can, can access these this auctions, and not only big players, but also there will be a fair, uh, fair opportunities for the middle and small size players. Next one, please. Um, yeah, this one, um, this is about the, the instruments that we didn't talk today about. These are about the, um, the projects of uh, the common interest, the priority projects that uh, are being supported within the framework of uh, Energy Community Treaty. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight the problematic thing from, one, from our point of view is that for Ukraine in the electricity sector, among the three projects that are proposed, two of them are the project to support the nuclear electricity export from Ukraine to EU. One of them is from the Pivdan Ukrainsk NPP, where we have old nuclear units, uh, two of them already operating beyond the projected lifetime. And the second one, even more problematic for us, is the, the transmission line from Khmelnytsky NPP to, to Poland. And the idea behind it, the idea that our ministry have and our nuclear operator have, is that uh, we will have one of our nuclear units disconnected from the Ukrainian grid and connected directly to European grid. And this electricity will, will be uh, transmitted to European money, to, to the European market. And the money they will get, they will use to construct two more nuclear units at this power station. These are the, not the new units, these are the old units that uh, were started, the constructions were started back in 80s, they were standing there for 30 years, and um, so now there is the plan that with this money that you, we will kind of get from the European taxpayers through this, uh, through this financing scheme, we will continue the construction of these two nuclear units. And um, the, I would like to highlight that when we speak about these priority projects, we really need to think whether they, um, they, whether they support any transition to what we were talking today about the transition to sustainable and uh, to, to the sustainable energy system, or they, uh, they only support this, the business as usual, because Ukraine is very heavily dependent still uh, when we speak about electricity on the nuclear sector. And, um, and this type of projects is not really something that would be the, 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 primary, the primary need for us. Next one, please. Hmm? Yeah, I think this is the, the last one with the, key, uh, with the key messages, I would say. 
uh, for the 2019. Um, so yes, the implementation of the adopted legislation on energy uh, efficiency should um, sh should actually be the in focus and should take place. Um, we also talked today about the national plan for climate and energy for the contracting parties until 2030. And uh, yeah, we, we are already in communication with our ministry and we know that they're thinking about the start of this process already in 2019. It was very nice to hear from Mr. Kopach today that uh, he knows that <laughs> Ukraine really takes it seriously because, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't have this feeling yet. <laughs> Uh, but we will continue, of course, to work with our ministry and we would really want to ensure that uh, the process uh, when this plan will be developed, the process will be clear and transparent and that there will be enough cooperation between the Ministry of Energy and between the Ministry of Environment because otherwise we're not going to get the good plan. But we also, we also know how, how challenging is this, ensure this cooperation between these ministries. Yes, as I said, uh, these two projects, uh, we strongly believe that um, under, under this framework, uh, this project should not serve this to support the, the nuclear electricity experts from countries like Ukraine to, to the European Union. And the last one, but not the least important, is that there is a need to think about how to support the economic and social innovations for the energy transition, including in those very uh, coal-dependent regions, but not, but not only. And uh, this is something that we, we really don't talk much in Ukraine about. This is something that we are now only starting to, 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 to talk about. And I think that the, the role of, um, the role of um, this um, uh, platform that Ukraine is now participating, that this platform that be, being now opened up for Ukraine should be very helpful. And I think that I think even the members of the civil society, our, our colleagues who are present at one of the meetings already, so uh, this is the this is the nice opportunity, but we also think there should be more uh, more thinking uh, and more um, more signals from the uh, from the European Commission from the European Union to uh, to help us find uh, this um, this ways and uh, and stimulate this discussion in Ukraine because otherwise it is very difficult to talk with the ministry to talk with the regional authorities but but actually with the regional authorities it's much more easier than even to go uh, and speak to the ministry so yes um, i think these are the key things uh, that um, from from our side and um, uh, these are these are the main things that will be important for 2019 to remember mm -hmm. thank you thank you Irina. for your excellent uh, um, comprehensive overview of uh, what Ukraine is facing at the moment in terms of energy transition. And now this is, uh, since we are approaching uh, quite rapidly uh, four o'clock and probably Mr. Wolf doesn't have too much time to stay with us. Uh, I would like to give the opportunity and the possibility to reflect on the things what we have heard in the last two, two and a half hours. If you can make it in a nutshell, uh, what because we were talking about the role of European Union in this region. Um, I mean, listen, this is, it's, it's an important debate and I'm prepared to give the time needed uh, and, and so. Um, I mean, in, in this, if I've got the interesting job of, of replying, sort of <laughs> summing up on behalf of the European Commission and, and I, you know, I had a presentation and so on, but I don't think that's uh, the best way to go forward. What I'd prefer to do is actually uh, to take uh, the different points that you've been making and to, to see what I can say in, uh, there's a lot of challenging things to respond to there and to say uh, how perhaps we can uh, see them uh, work forward in relation to them. I think too, what's really, really just to say what my role is, I, I first of all apologize in not looking after Ukraine, but I do look after the Western Balkans and I look after the regional co cooperation there. I do that and also try to work as closely with Ivana here, who's uh, 
responsible for climate change issues, and also with our DG Energy colleagues. So in, even in addition to the uh, different challenges you've been talking about, I think there's the whole question of pulling things together. <laughs> Um, and so, I, I maybe to, to, to pick up on a few things, and uh, maybe uh, first with Janos Kopacz, because you're, you're here beside me. And I think you're certainly, you're pointing to the need to uh, work, how shall I say, more pointedly together. Um, I, looking at the things that you particularly called for, I think what is important uh, for us, and perhaps we're already moving forward on it, but it's... Uh, uh, is, is this whole question of making electricity regional and looking at that. And, and you know that um, uh, you, and, you and I and others have, I, I think, uh, really made some efforts to try and make sure that indeed the whole uh, question of electricity supply in uh, the Western Balkans is looked at in that regional way. You mentioned too the whole question of not just, uh, how shall I say, uh, supporting um, the renewables in terms of uh, their sustainable, saying that they're sustainable, but also doing the practical matters to to follow through on that. And uh, I mean, it, it's it is the case, and we want to uh, maybe even increase this uh, to to look at support for that in financial terms, in program terms, in project terms, and so on. And I think there's really quite a deal uh, that is happening in respect of that. You said, and I took real note of it. Um, you said, look, make EU money conditional. Mm. And uh, you said, Ukraine, better example, Western Balkans, not such a good example. So I think uh, what I'll do is I'll take that away. I thought we were, uh, in, in certain instances, looking at uh, how we could uh, indeed make the support uh, conditional on the reforms being done. Um, Indeed, I think we'd be in discussion about that, that next week, but um, maybe we need further effort in respect to it. Anyway, I, I, I hear your point. But there was one other thing you did say, which I, I also personally, um, amongst all the different challenges, all the different issues, all the different difficulties, you did say that energy uh, efficiency, and I guess you're talking about energy transition in general, can also be seen as an opportunity. And. Uh, I think actually that's quite an important point to underline because one of the things I'll come back to is the need for public support for this. And I think in many ways uh, to be able to uh, generate a momentum in favor of energy transition, in favor of a, a, a how shall I say, a, a greener uh, approach to energy matters in the Western Balkans, indeed in Ukraine, you do have to bring public opinion along with you, and you have to, to use that to be able to uh, really get the leverage in respect of the, 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 the politicians, and I think opportunity is an important word. Um, <laughs> to come to the other presentations, uh, I mean, um, I, I think it was Mr. Zisko, you, you had your, I mean, very very uh, uh, striking video, and uh, you said it doesn't look like European practice to you. Hmm. It didn't look like European practice to me. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, I just say, uh, Mrs. Amon, and uh, that um, it's also uh, one of the things that as commission I wanted, uh, was, I thought was very important was that you come and you do present this to us because you're in the region, we're not as much in the region, uh, and it's very important for these points to be made and made graphically uh, to us. It's all very well. Uh, I was traveling in the region last week, uh, saw the uh, pollution in places like Pristina, in, in Tetovo was mentioned, I was there, and so on, uh, in, in, in Tuzla, and so on. But I think, you know, we have the, uh, how shall I say, the position, the European Commission, that we're in and out of the region. And it's a very different matter to, I think, have the point made that, listen, uh, this, is, um, this is something that's it's, uh, it, it's, it's a problem all the time uh, for the people in the region. I think it's not only these things that are the challenges. Incidentally, maybe I'm echoing things that you're already saying, but we're hearing also that, of course, there is the challenge of, in, in, even with all these difficulties, that uh, clearly the energy supply has to be uh, reliable. That, that this is crucial and that, that there's also push factors that make, make some of the points that you're making not always so easy to move towards. 
um, that the region itself is facing, uh, if I understand it correctly, rising energy demands. And certainly this, uh, this argument is made to us in respect of uh, the need for support for growth, for jobs, for competitiveness, for modernization and so on. Uh, we're very aware of uh, the um, resistance, if you like, uh, to um, at times uh, restored or improved connectivity within the region and the uh, background to that, and that's certainly a challenge. And we know about the difficulties in respect of the energy market reforms and why there's uh, resistance to these. So I do want to underline these as challenges that are very much in our uh, perspective. The, the whole question of the loans coming from elsewhere and uh, support, this, I mean, is uh, clearly also uh, very much a challenge or a concern that uh, we would have too. I think we have to, um, you, you know, also, uh, how shall I say, uh, we have to be um, realistic about it. It is there, but we have to insist on our standards in respect of it, and we have to point out uh, the uh, the real drawbacks in terms of the fact that obviously loans have to be paid back, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in uh, the way that we make our arguments to uh, the, the people in uh, the regions. Can I look, 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 just turn a little bit to the sort of the challenges? And I'm certainly not doing justice to all that I've heard and we heard, but I, I also maybe look a little bit to the opportunities. Um, and um, I did. I thought I took up anyway uh, that uh, Mr. Makuru, Mr. Makuru's. Uh, am I, you did say that there are um, the transition has been possible that there, this has uh, it, it has been happening and and I, I think you know we have to even if it isn't uh, always progressing as we want uh, it needs uh, a lot of attention I think uh, it is an important message the transition is look to what it is that has been able to um, promote that transition what it is that uh, has had to be overcome what it is that are uh, the difficulty, but what also are the ways, the solutions around them. So that's, it's an important uh, message. I think uh, it's very clear that in terms of um, the uh, energy efficiency, that there are really, really significant gains that can be made with, within the region because of the current energy intensity and so on. And, and, um, and I think what we've got to do is, in, in terms of opportunities, look for where we can make uh, credible um, ad advances uh, and maybe do it uh, so that uh, those advances are, are done relatively quickly and can be, uh, how shall I say, used as, uh, first of all, a demonstration of what is possible, but also uh, a demonstration of the direction of travel and what needs to be done uh, for the future. I think, too, uh, there is, because um, uh, clearly, uh, as uh, the other um, uh, advances are made elsewhere, uh, there is the opportunity uh, to uh, opt for good low carbon options and not make the mistakes maybe that were made in, in other areas or in other uh, regions. Um, and uh, it's, it's very clear that in general, if I understood your graphs rightly, there is a, a really a, a great potential, and I, I understand you were making, um, the, how shall I say, distinctions between different types of renewables, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, if I understand you rightly, that uh, certain renewables we can make uh, progress, mm -hmm. progress mm -hmm. with. Um, I also think that um, it, to widen out the discussion more, um, that in uh, what uh, we on the European Commission side uh, want to promote in terms of in our regional economic area, actually, whatever it is, in terms of um, stimulating uh, growth, because clearly there's uh, a, a need and a demand and an opportunity for that, that we uh, make sure that we always uh, emphasize the, uh, uh, the, the option of green growth, that we emphasize the option of smart and sustainable growth, uh, and that we make sure that uh, in the way uh, that uh, we, um, we, we do this, that we uh, take the message that I think Mrs. Harms made right at the beginning, which is in relation to energy matters, in relation uh, to all that's linked to it, that we look at research and innovation and how that uh, can uh, indeed uh, be uh, used uh, to, to make sure that uh, business and uh, other activity takes it up in a way that uh, can make us uh, move forward in a, in, a, in a way. And I also, uh, sorry, I don't want to answer, but I did very much uh, take the point that we, and maybe this is a particular responsibility for the part of the Commission I come from, we need to work on the political will. We need to work on the political will in the region, and that this can't be just a question of how shall I say, looking. Uh, it, it's not quite form-filling, but you know what I mean. That uh, what is done is somehow or another that we say 
uh, that uh, it, it technically things have been done, but somehow or another uh, that in reality uh, the uh, things have not uh, moved forward. There hasn't been the conviction and that there hasn't uh, therefore been the drive through uh, that, um, that, that we want. Um, can I just maybe just underline, I'm not going to, I've got a page here, but I'm not going to go through it all, but to pick up on some of the things that I think uh, I would like to take, uh, have a, as, as takeaways. The first is, I think um, the need, uh, if I understood it correctly, to work on public opinion and to work with uh, the um, uh, civil society organisations and to involve them. I think this is uh, really uh, important. I think it's uh, obviously it's, uh, it's a very important idea in itself. It's maybe particularly important in this region, and I think it's also very uh, important that somehow or another uh, the things that we're talking about here today do not appear to be coming from the outside, that they have to be understood and uh, they have to be bought into, if you like, by uh, the, the people in the organisations from within the region. I think, uh, to uh, you, uh, I'd, I'd like to, the message about uh, setting uh, clearer policy objectives and following through on them, and also placing those within uh, the context of the overall development of objectives, if I understand uh, correctly. Uh, and uh, I do feel that um, there is the need not only to do that in terms of, I mean, there's various components to this, there's legal frameworks, there's the reforms, there's incentives and so on, um, but I also think that, that there has to be some element of inspiration in this, and that those policy objectives have to be set in terms that uh, people within the, again comes to people within the region that they can uh, feel enthusiastic about whether it's green Balkans or nature Balkans or uh, cutting whatever it is you, you, you perhaps know this better I think in terms also of uh, the follow-through on those policy objectives that we have to have a clearer uh, clearer action plans and uh, I, I very much got the message that it's not just about the action plans but about insisting that indeed what is set out in those action plans is followed through on, if I understood the points that uh, you were making as well. And, and uh, there's a particular um, uh, responsibility that uh, I have, which is um, to be able to look at how we can mobilize investment in a good way, uh, because uh, it's clear that uh, there's a very significant uh, demand for uh, investment in relation to all of this. That cannot, uh, it, just, it, it is not uh, the case that it uh, can come from uh, public investment, so we have to find ways in which private private investment can be stimulated, that public and private investment can be uh, blended and whatever, and that we can make sure that the uh, programs and projects that are really the most um, uh, useful can, um, uh, uh, can be stimulated. I hope that's not what's driving <laughs> 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 And I'll, I'll take one really further point, uh, because uh, Mrs. Holokova, you made it just now, and I thought you made it very well. Uh, it was made by several others, that in terms of uh, what we need to do, it's not just about mobilizing investment, it's not just about projects, it's not just about, pro but it's also about looking at uh, the uh, ho holistic approach to this in, in quite uh, many regions. And a lot of people talked about uh, the miners and the need for job trans transformation. I think you've got to look at, uh, obviously, the um, opportunities uh, for uh, uh, whole regions uh, to, to have uh, uh, ways, uh, is, have, have um, a plan uh, in, through which they can transform themselves. And we've got, I think, very much to support that and use the good examples, because there are good examples of how that has, and I think you're probably aware of this, Mrs. Amon, in the EU28, where there have been, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, how shall I say, good uh, initiatives taken at the regional level uh, with that more holistic approach, looking at human capital, looking at uh, the opportunities to inv involve uh, research and innovation and uh, more, uh, how shall I say, um, uh, enterprising uh, investment uh, and so on. Um, so uh, what can the EU do? Well, I, I think we can uh, listen, we can promote our um, uh, standards and our approach, uh, let us hope, as, as something of a model. We can help set those policy objectives and that planning that I talked about. We put a lot of effort into capacity building, uh, public administration reform and so on. We can share some evidence uh, or examples from uh, 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 that are already, I think, uh, evident in the EU28, and we can, I think, facilitate that there's more, how shall I say, uh, opportunities for uh, the uh, different uh, actors in the region to become part of uh, those networks of experience that do exist within uh, the um, uh, the EU. Uh, I, I think it's very clear that uh, the legal work um, is uh, really crucial, and uh, to make sure that the negotiations and the acquis are uh, looked are. Um, fully, uh, how shall I say, uh, 
used as a lever in terms of uh, making sure that there is uh, the, um, the standards uh, set, and uh, maybe to take a particular note uh, of this gap that you identified, mm -hmm. Janos, between, on the one hand, the uh, energy community a key and the other, uh, the EU a key. Uh, I think uh, we can uh, look at uh, ways in which uh, we can mobilise that funding better. We have the uh, initiatives like the Green for Growth Fund or the Re Regional Energy Efficiency Programme, which we've really got to, I think, maximise the, um, the use of. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, too, uh, that we've got to uh, make sure uh, that um, the uh, projects that we do support are indeed the best projects that uh, can, be, um, uh, can be found. Can I just finish? by saying one other thing, uh, which is that um, there is a, a number of you mentioned uh, the, uh, uh, the context of uh, renewed EU engagement in the region and the strategy that the Commission uh, adopted in the communication early in the year, and then there was a declaration at the summit in Sofia. And then uh, I detected that there were some doubts about the way that this was moving forward. Fair enough. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like that from my side of the table, but that's, uh, that's, that's one thing. But why do I say that? Because, in fact, um, what has been set as the priorities in uh, those documents, uh, now it is, I have had to swing my entire programming exercise uh, for 2019, quite rightly, I say, round, uh, this is the regional program, to responding uh, to the needs, uh, what is identified as the needs of those flagships. And of course, the, those, there's very much the uh, emphasis on energy connectivity, um, market reforms, uh, renewables, et cetera, et cetera, in that. So if, uh, and we have, uh, I think, and quite rightly, because somebody else mentioned the importance of reporting, we have, uh, how shall I say, uh, found that we need to be very much more accountable to other institutions, yourselves, but uh, also the uh, EU member states and the council, uh, to uh, being responsive to what is uh, identified. And I think it is very useful for our discussion here today, what is identified uh, in uh, the, um, uh, that uh, communication in February and also what is in that uh, SOFIA declaration, and particularly uh, the annex. That's the uh, practical uh, part. I took note uh, of uh, the fact that uh, you would uh, like um, at some stage maybe for the Commission to make a further report to the Parliament. That sounded like uh, a very uh, good idea. And I would also say and draw attention to the need for all of us, <laughs> us uh, as proposers, but of course yourselves as uh, the uh, co-deciders uh, to uh, look at the uh, opportunities of uh, the discussions currently taking place in respect of the next generation of the instrument for pre-accession. Sorry, this isn't particularly the Ukraine, but the same thing is coming along. Uh, where there is, I think, perhaps, uh, not perhaps, there is the opportunity to make sure that uh, not so much necessarily on the a key side, but certainly on the uh, support side, to make sure that indeed uh, the support is there for uh, yeah. the types of um, facing up to the types of challenges that you've identified. I've been too long. Sorry about that, but I hope I've uh, covered uh, uh, quite a number of the points that were made. Thank you very much. I'm uh, afraid we won't have too much time for the debate or discussion at this point. But if there is anyone who would have a striking question or a comment here, then uh, I think we should put something like Commission. five. <laughs> and yeah, first, Ooh. probably here and then. Thank you so much, uh, Ada. And I would like also to thank all the other speakers uh, for their uh, presentations uh, and really there was quite a lot of issues that were mentioned today. So I will try not to repeat the ones that Colin has already mentioned, but uh, I'd like to um, maybe pick up on some of the issues that were mentioned also by uh, Janis in, in uh, his presentation on the work of energy community. Um, we as uh, the Commission and DG uh, Klima are working quite closely uh, with the region. We've been having projects in the past. We also have project now, and we are planning to continue to support the region uh, in the future as well. I also need to say that in regional context, we also work with Turkey. So it's not just the Western Balkans, but also Turkey is included. And uh, this is some 
thing that has been quite important in the past in terms of exchange of experiences in the region because we've seen that quite a lot of issues are relevant throughout the region and that countries can exchange quite useful experiences but we also been able to bring uh, member state experts to really uh, uh, talk about very technical issues but also some political issues to, to discuss. So um, maybe just to, to say that this is why we think uh, that regulatory framework for the countries is extremely important. I mean, what we've seen, what Dennis was presenting in his uh, presentation, you know, really uh, awful uh, situation around Tuzla. You know, this is a consequence of the existing legislation not being properly implemented. Uh, and also not having the proper framework in which you actually have the inspection, so the inspection works and you can actually go to them and they would uh, really react. So the functioning administration, which also has the good working inspection who understands uh, all of these issues. Um, and then uh, let me go back to something that uh, Yanis was mentioning and also Alexander was mentioning in, in the terms of how actually we will work uh, in the future. So not just working on the um, national action plans on energy and climate, but also something where we see and which was has been mentioned in the new enlargement strategy is the extension of energy union to the region, which I think is something that really needs to be uh, considered quite carefully, uh, because some of these issues that we are discussing now, especially in the preparation of the integrated action plans, will be very pertinent. Uh, Jan, as you mentioned, uh, carbon leakage, but there will also be issues uh, with the ETS, um, because of the market integrity and so on. So some of the very complicated technical issues which I'm mentioning now, but because some other uh, speakers have also mentioned them, I thought that we should really, uh, I should really um, say something about it. And also say that we uh, and the colleagues from DG Ener have been working closely with the uh, energy community and with the parties in terms of preparing the path towards uh, the preparation of the integrated action plans on, on, climate, uh, uh, on climate and energy, which our member states are currently preparing and will have a draft ready at the end of this year and then uh, finalized by two, 2019. Um, and just maybe to mention that uh, the project that we hope will be there uh, by the beginning of next year will actually be there to assist the countries in uh, preparing those plans, but also working with them on their long-term strategies, which is one of their um, obligations under the Paris Agreement by 2020. And let me just finish by saying that um, at the COP in Katowice, one of the issues that will be discussed will be exactly the just transition under the Silesia Declaration. So this is also an opportunity to, to tackle this very important issue for the region. Thank you so much for your time. Because of the time constraint, I will skip my comment. So just uh, two short questions. Uh, the question to Mr. Yanez uh, Kopac. Uh, as, a, as a first uh, uh, barrier, you noted uh, the resistance to liberalization of energy market. Uh, since obviously uh, the users would be beneficiary of the liberalization, how do you explain the lack of pressure from their side, from the user side, especially uh, industry uh, sector, uh, to the authorities, to the different levels of governments, to speed up the, the market liberalization? This is the first question. And the second question is, uh, uh, when you commented uh, and, and showed uh, some progress in, in the certain uh, area, of different countries uh, within energy community, 
and then you said that some countries uh, made some uh, progress, and even Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I, I, I heard this even. So what is behind of this word even? Uh, okay, perhaps it was not too polite, but you know that in Bosnia and Herzegovina it's really hard to push through any reform because uh, there are two entities, uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Republika Srpska, and they block each other on every step uh, 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 with everything what is state-related. Things which are uh, uh, entity-related are somehow functioning. Um, energy efficiency, which is responsible uh, competence of uh, both entities, is in Republika Srpska quite well advanced, in Federation a little bit less, but still functions. Uh, but uh, electricity market, gas market, so these are things which have to be regulated on the state level, are blocked. Uh, this is why I said even. Uh, uh, but this is the only case which we have in our contracting parties, because in all other contracting parties, things are moving with some dynamics, which could be faster, but at least it's moving. Uh, in Bosnia, it's, it's blocked. Uh, and uh, um, the uh, first question, you said uh, how to stimulate consumers to be more active. Uh, the problem is that big consumers who are really, uh, let's say, who, who, who would be uh, very loud are eligible customers, and they are on a free market. But uh, uh, the, the consumers uh, from the range of uh, small and medium enterprises are paying cross subsidies. Um, and uh, they are not organized, they are not loud, and they don't show up. Uh, but this is uh, the case. Uh, they were a little bit loud in Macedonia, and it helped. Uh, and Macedonia is now, I, I have to say, uh, most uh, the country with most liberalized electricity market in the whole region. Uh, so if I talk about energy community contracting parties, more, around 50% or even more of electricity is sold really market-based. Uh, and uh, I think the last regulation will be phased out in, in a year or two. So Macedonia is most advanced with liberalization of electricity market currently. Um, so uh, things are happening, and it will happen, but it could happen faster. Uh, but uh, at least for Western Balkans, uh, I'm not concerned because Western Balkans is part of European, uh, of uh, Central con uh, Continental European uh, synchronous zone, and this uh, electricity flows are unstoppable, and it will happen sooner or later. Uh, a bigger problem is, is uh, Ukraine and Moldova because they are physically disconnected. Uh, and then uh, resistance there is even doesn't have this pressure from the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Albien Arishitai. I'm a political advisor of, uh, Prime Minister, to the Prime Minister office. I was a Minister of Environment and Special Planning from Kosovo. I would like just to uh, thank you, uh, to thank Rebecca and Benedek and Amon and Mr. Uh, Kopac. Uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, very good uh, conference. And uh, thank you for invitation. And I would like just to add that uh, something that anybody don't mention except the Mr. AUP, that uh, Kosovo is one of the countries with the largest lignite coal res reserves in the world that it uses to produce electricity. The construction of the new power plant will use the la latest technology that will enable the reduction of gases and the pre preservation of the environment. Uh, we are working to improve energy efficiency and renewable energy, but we are in a transition and um, we are open to take help uh, from uh, you to create energy alternatives uh, friendly with the environment. Uh, as we are open uh, 
uh, to, uh, and we are waiting for, from EU to help uh, us for uh, visa liberalization as uh, Kosovo people and is expect the uh, uh, youngest people from Kosovo. I'm sorry. I'm and, sorry. Uh, we are. We uh, after that we are ready to be part of uh, liberalization uh, uh, of energy market. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry to to interrupt, but uh, we just and thank you for your intervention. Um, uh, we just um, got the message that it was quite harsh to that we have to leave the room quite soon or shortly. Um, and I still would like to, to, to summarize or wrap up the, the meeting or the event a uh, little bit to this extent we have here. Um, first uh, and foremost, I think what we have all agreed and what we have the reinforcement uh, to our first political recommendation of, of the report, what we have just launched, is that uh, the Energy Community Secretariat and the whole treaty is very, uh, very uh, important, played a very important role in, in the transition so far or the, the, the development in the region so far, which is an important message. And uh, what is even more important, I guess, is that uh, the, the facilitating power and the trust uh, what is there towards this uh, project, if I can name it as a project, uh, is, is very visible from the region. So it would be very important. And probably uh, this way, it's, it's, it's a very kind of non-expensive way of transposing uh, a lot of uh, the EU acquis. Uh, and uh, what we have also seen is the, the problem of financing uh, the, the transition. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, less of a problem f for the political establishment to finance or maintain the already existing infrastructure, which is a, which is a problem. Uh, so uh, what would be needed exactly, technical support and assistance how to how to crowd uh, investment and how to make it happen in these countries interconnectivity is a is a big issue and if uh, if we are talking about because i would rather focus on on the european union's role in this is the analytical uh, uh, capacity to see what the possibility and the risk of creating a huge amount of stranded asset in, in these countries. And if that happens, it is a social issue because it is taking away the money and, and financing the past rather than, uh, than any good future transition. And financing, uh, as we have heard uh, many times, China is, uh, is very much coming in financing uh, and probably they would be financing anything what they would be offered to finance. So why don't we offer and why don't we use the European Union's diplomatic forces to, to redirect that kind of, uh, that huge amount of money, that, that volume of money into green uh, infrastructure and green uh, energy projects rather than financing old and dirty thermal power plants or, uh, well, probably not nuclear because uh, Ukraine is not a needed uh, Chinese investment probably, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is uh, basically my takeaways and, and my uh, kind of uh, slogans for for uh, EU and and the energy community uh, area and with this I would like to thank you all for coming here today uh, 
for our distinguished speakers to to be available and sharing their experience and knowledge uh, with us. And hopefully a lot of uh, people were watching us or will be watching us uh, because it will be online uh, for, for the future. So thank you very much again. And uh, now I'm closing this session with this. Thank you.